Uh, hello, this is a new interview I'm doing, and I forgot to bring up my notes, so just a moment. Uh, I had significant technical problems at the start of this, but it's looking much better now. And I forgot, uh, okay, forgot what I was gonna say. Yeah, we can see the professional of professionalism here. Okay, have to be, uh, this is another interview that just sort of fell into my lap like the last one where I decided why not. Uh, with our guest here, J.C. Reese Anthus, who's a sociologist and statistician. Uh, I, I see this as almost a little bit of, as a follow-up to the last discussion about AI, but we may veer into some different topics too, because, especially because of his sociology background. So the first chunk will be a lot about AI. After that, it might be more just kind of societal issues in general, maybe some miscellaneous things. Uh, yeah, the last one didn't really go how I hoped because, uh, well, I went in blind. This time I did not, and I'm much more optimistic about this one. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he does, yeah, this, this, I think this will be interesting because from what I've gathered, he has a couple of views I'm skeptical on, but then he has others that I think he may have better perspective on this than anyone I know. And even the stuff I'm skeptical on, I think it's going to lead to some questions I think are gonna be really interesting. So uh, e even if you're uh, not liking some parts of the chat, you know, maybe somebody will timestamp this later on YouTube. So you might wanna jump ahead, but we'll see how it goes. So uh, let's see, I, th I think that's about it for intro. I guess the, the first thing I was gonna say is if you wanna give more on your background or credentials, uh, you can go ahead. The I, I noticed from looking at your website, you're someone who I imagine is good at making resumes because you had dozens of bullet points on your background. So uh, it, it, I, I'm I'm not too picky about that, but maybe some of the audience might be more curious about you, you know your background rather than what you have to say. So if you wanna let sure, people know yeah. what. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you're diving into different topics. Um, it's pretty eclectic and, and brave and uh, exciting, I think. Uh, despite my concerns and others about the future, um, it's good to have curious, smart people into these new topics, even if it's like not where your background is. Uh, maybe a bit of relevant stuff about my background. So I, I work at a small organization called Sentience Institute, which researches social and technological change. Most of my research career has been focused on non-human animals and the issue of factory farming, which I think is like the big environmental and animal welfare elephant in the room. Uh, I did a book on that that came out in 2018. And like many, uh, AI was on the horizon and seemed increasingly important and neglected for all these reasons. So I started researching it then. Um, and I also never got a PhD before doing my first book. So I'm back in grad school now as well, uh, as you said, in sociology and statistics and focus on AI, but from a similar lens. So the same way, like I'm looking at a big social movement of animal rights and technologies like cultured meat. I'm now looking at technologies around AI. Yeah, yeah you, you, were, you were in a few different fields. And real quick uh, to the chat, how are the volume levels between us? I forgot to check. Am I coming in a little too loud or he's coming in too quiet or? Well, yeah, so there'll be a bit of a delay on that, but yeah, I only have a bachelor's. I could see where things were going college-wise that I was, <laughs> that that was enough for my aspirations, but uh, okay, we have one person saying good audio. I think I'll turn myself down just a tad. That'll, if I'm too quiet, yeah, and Chad, at any point, if there's a technical issue, you can just spam me in all capital letters, so that's a... I don't always keep track of what's going on with it. Uh, okay, so I guess the first thing I wanted to bring up, do you wanna state your position as to why you contacted me or should, maybe we should do that rather than me pulling up the email just because I'm afraid I'll break something at this point. <laughs> uh, no worries. Yeah, um, like I said, you know, with ChatGPT in November, but even the writing was on the wall back with like GPT-3 and and 2 and um, really the advent of deep learning in 2012. So AI is having another moment, but kind of its biggest one yet. 
Um, so some researchers like me have been trying to get in touch more with journalists and doing podcasts and radio shows. I did a couple op-eds. Um, and Eliezer Yukowski, your previous guest, uh, has been you know making the rounds on a lot of those. Um, so I saw that you had talked to him and I had some thoughts on different arguments. There are lots of things I agree with uh, him on and things that I disagree. So I thought it'd be a good follow-up. Um, and I think, yeah, a lot of it comes down to like, uh, some of the fundamental intuitions as to like, what is intelligence is, is it possible for machines to get smarter than us? And these like fundamental questions that are really tricky with. And I think, uh, going back and forth for like hours with people is actually like one of the best ways to think through them. Yeah. yeah well, y y your stance struck me as different than his, but it overlaps um, a, a lot in a way that I'm trying to get differing views from mine on this be because I could bring out experts that will probably confirm everything I'm thinking, but then that still leaves me in the dark as to why people are thinking something else. So that, that's, but, and in your case in particular, I think it's going to lead to other questions. So um, I'll just state what I, off the top of my head, roughly what I remembered in your email is that you, and you can correct me at any point. Oh, oh, and another thing I should mention while I'm thinking of it. If at any point I'm using the incorrect terminology on something where you think you understand what I'm saying, feel free to reel me in and uh, get, tell me the right word I should be using because I, I, you'll probably get the concept, but I'm uh, layman at this. Uh, so, you know, with sapience, sentience, consciousness, intelligence. So I've noticed different people can define those differently. So at, at any point, you can get in that. Well, what I remember in your email... You, one of the big points that you were concerned about with AI was uh, that you seem either they are now, I, I seem to think this is going to be more future focused, that they're going, that there's a high likelihood of them emerging as sentient agents, so that they're kind of their own sorts of digital beings. Uh, and you were concerned in particular on that with the ethics regarding that situation, because if these are new sentient forms, then we should, you know, be thinking about the eth ethics of that situation. And am I summar summarizing that correctly or? Yeah, that's what I did uh, some recent discussions on. And I did an op-ed in The Hill on actually we needed an AI rights movement, which is probably the most provocative thing I've written to date. But it was on that issue. Exactly. Um, I'd say like the general frame, maybe I want to like start with here is thinking of these AIs as like digital minds and the word mind is, is, well, let's say the word digital refers to like bits on a computer or you could say artificial. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Mind is like a very general term that I like because it includes all sorts of different mental faculties. And I think like each of the topics we can discuss here usually aligns with one of those faculties. Um, so the three that I would highlight that I think are, are most important here are sentience, agency, and intelligence. And I think these are like pretty analytically distinct. They overlap and they're connected in, in myriad ways. Um, but like we can discuss them pretty fruitfully one at a time. Um, sentience is the capacity to have positive and negative experiences. So most uh, famously, it's pleasure and suffering uh, or happiness and, and pain, um, good and bad. And this is like usually relevant because you matter insofar as you can experience those things. So Jeremy Bentham talking about animal rights, one of the first philosophers to bring up that issue in a big way, said the question about animals is not, can they reason or can they think, but can they suffer, pointing to sentience. And yeah, I think that's been a relatively neglected part of the conversation compared to agency and intelligence. And in particular, I worry about us having bad relations with, with these new AIs that we're creating, if they develop sentience, if we cause them to suffer, both because it's bad in its own right, um, you know, a lot of sci-fi is based on this, like um, mass abuse and exploitation of robots, of course, um, but also like that could be a really negative relationship that could cause harms in the other direction. We treat them poorly and they treat us poorly. Yeah. Um, what, what I suspect is you, I, I don't have a, much of a problem considering them as minds conceptually, uh, you know, that, okay, if these actually are individual beings, then yeah, that they would, we would want to consider ethics regarding that. I, I guess my main hang up is I, I'm skeptical about them actually becoming that as opposed to ju just a program that's a very good kind of mimic of what we'd expect a sentient or intelligent being to look look like. It, yeah, and I did see on your other, 
one of your other videos where you mentioned that, like, you know, whether someone can feel pain or not or pleasure is a better metric than reasoning. And I think you even mentioned, like, a microbe as an example, how it will try to avoid something that's, like, you know, too hot or toxic or something like that to it. And, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that that aspect of it. Uh I guess should I ask one of my questions, or did you want to go down the other parts you were mentioning first? Or I, I it'd probably be good to handle them one at a time. Um, okay. Maybe I'll I'll just very briefly say that like intelligence is problem solving ability. Okay. Um, so a lot of people get hung up on like, is it really artificial intelligence? I think you can like talk about reasoning. So in one interview, I talked about reasoning as like abstraction, so using logic. But that's only one way to solve problems. There are a bunch of different ways. I think intelligence is as good as just like a general capacity. So when we say things like, you know, the latest of these models, GPT-4 or BARD, can now pass the bar exam to become a lawyer in the US. Um, that's just like a capacity. We, we can talk about whether it's an important one or not. Taking tests is very different than actually doing a job, um, but that's intelligence. Agency is the ability to like take action, form goals. There's a lot of debate about exactly what it is, but it's sort of the acting part. And like, that's where a lot of the danger comes in is if you like use that intelligence to take action in the world. So that's like the rough bird's eye view of these three capacities. Okay. Um... Yeah, well, I guess I had two big questions. I'll, I guess I'll. Okay, well, yeah, I guess the, I guess the my big question would be. Well, okay, if, well, well, let me clarify something first. Do you think we these entities, as you're describing them, exist now, or is this something you see on the horizon? That, I should clarify that. Yeah, I think we have digital minds now. Um, I think it's it's really unique that we now have technology that can go out in the world and, and take action in a way no other one has. It's like becoming more like a coworker than anything before. You know, when we think about Excel spreadsheets or calculators or OBS um, or anything, it, it misbehaves um, as we can tell, but it's, it's not um, forming this like complex mental system that I think is, is really unprecedented and different. Um, <clears throat> even just intelligence and reasoning. And I think some level of agency exists in current systems. Um, sentience is more complicated. Uh, I don't think of it as like, so some people think of sentience as like, is there a light on or not? So they have these questions of like, well, there's some probability that the, the light bulb was on in certain animals, you know, maybe um, birds and mammals have the light on, but you think fish don't or are unlikely to, and then like insects really don't or something. I have like a gradient view, and I think there's there's a lot to discuss on exactly how do we define it and where would we put it? But current systems, maybe like below insects is where I'd sort of say, if they have any, it's not much, it's less than an insect. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that somebody will probably correct me later because you mentioned the light on, on one, I think this is sapience maybe. The, on one level you have, you know, humans and then you have some like primates or dolphins or I, th I think even crows to some extent that, that seem to have a, more awareness or consciousness, but on the bottom level, you know, some cells or my, microbes, they still have their own, they're still doing something like that. They're driven by forces. <laughs> so that's not going to be the same thing as like, I guess what I would call consciousness, but there's something going on there. So I guess my, okay, well, I guess my immediate question then, if you think we have digital minds now, all this, all the, the examples you mentioned, like OBS or Twitch or calculator program, Excel, I just see those as code that just programs running. I see them as having, no, I do not see these things as capable of experiencing pain in any capacity. I, I see it almost like an incredibly large abacus kind of shifting around that's being run by electricity or so, something like that. Mm. In, in your opinion, do any of these programs right now warrant the sort of like ethical, not, not in their use, but as their them themselves as entities warrant any sort of ethical consideration? Are, are we at that point with any software yet, in your opinion? Uh, yeah, let's say let's say none of the ones you mentioned. Okay, I think uh, Chat GPT and like current AI systems are the level where we should start having this conversation. We should, for example, be trying to come up with tests we can run um, because I think we we don't know. And I think this is going to come up in our discussion a lot uh, is like we we don't know a lot of things here. Um, to what extent should should we default to, OK, 
we should, it's going to be the status quo. We're not going to get super intelligence. We're not going to get sentience because we just like don't know how it works. We're not even close to that understanding, let's say of the human brain versus another prior you could have, as we say, as statisticians, your Bayesian prior, like another baseline expectation of, well, we don't know. So all of the outcomes are kind of still on the table. And when some of them matter as much as sentience and agency and super intelligence do, um, they should still be on the table. But no, I, I don't think those current systems do. I wouldn't say that they feel pain. I do have a friend, Brian Tomasic, who in 2016, I think, wrote an article in Vox on whether non-player characters in video games could suffer um, and said, like, we should be worried about them. A tiny, tiny amount. But if there are so many of them, they could really matter. I'm sympathetic to that view. As you said, like, the key challenge to the view that there's, like, a light on or that current systems aren't experiencing anything is, like, okay, point to the thing, like, like, what's the test? What is the actual thing that they don't have without invoking just like, oh, they don't have a spirit or a soul or a light on just like without appealing to that sort of broad intuition. I think that's hard. I don't think that's a definitive argument. And like, I'm not going around advocating for the rights of non-player characters, but I think it's really interesting. And it's a good like starting point to make us modest and realize that there's a lot we don't know. So by going through these like individual benchmarks, and we have a blog post on our website, Sentience Institute, where one of our researchers like has a whole table of these different features that oh, we might want to be on the lookout for. And, you know, maybe if an, if an AI starts to check, I don't know, there are maybe 15 of them, if it like checks five out of 15, like, hey, let's let's get worried and, and be cautious because we don't want to cause undue suffering. Well, now you're entering my wheelhouse a bit, talking about NPC <laughs> characters, because I'd say there's a fair chance I've encounter more NPC characters than maybe you and your friend combined. <laughs> like, so, well, and there may be a lot of the audience watching here too. So now you're, now you're on more of an uphill slope here. Uh, I, I will come down 100% firm that no a NPC, you do not have to worry about the feelings or ethical treatment of any uh, NPC in existence, even that new game experiment they did, where if you're the familiar NVIDIA with it, where, it was, yeah, it was like this kind of small town yeah. where the AI generated the character responses or something like that. Oh yeah, but did you see the NVIDIA showcase uh, where Jensen at, at NVIDIA had a like bar that you go into and the bartender was a chatbot, was like a GPT-4 oh, I, I have not chatbot. seen that. I think I heard of that. Yeah, and facial expressions were automated too. I, I, yeah. See, I I get that, but see, on my in my brain. I see that as just different routes. One's incredibly more complex, but I see that as the equivalent of going into an amusement park or Disney World or something and seeing an autom automaton, like, like automatronics. That I was surprised. I even saw a clip of that the other day. I was thinking, wow, that is really good. And this was mechanical. Just I think they had like Beauty and the Beast of them, the, the bell moving around. I was thinking, like, wow, they really get that kind of expression out of just a mechanical. You, I, I think there is an ethics issue. Well, we'll probably agree on that. This there is an issue, ethics potential issue with that, and that if just a human is treating the NPC character poorly, maybe that rubs off on their psyche that they manifest that in other ways towards actual people. So, I mean, I'm with that, but as far as the the NPC itself, then I, I'm, re I'm, f I'm pretty firmly in this camp. You can trace the code back on pretty much all those, and it's, it's, it, it's the culmination of the original programmers trying to predict many different events, and with more modern ones just trying to give it more f free form, like machine learning, yeah. you know, with... Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not going to like defend the rights of non-player characters. Okay. Um, okay. But, well, we're, we're still on the same page. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, but I think like uh, as they get more advanced, so like NVIDIA, you know, a few showcases down the road, we should maybe start having the conversation. But uh, there's an abstract thing that you're getting at exactly. And I want to like ask you about it and explore it more because it's sort of the foundation of this. Oh, sure. Uh, so I noticed that like, in, and you have a little chart, like a visualization of your views on this, which is really valuable. Okay, and I cool. noticed that you, the contrast you draw. So a lot of people would say that like, the, the contrast is conscious and non-conscious, but you specifically say like conscious or sentient or super intelligent or something and like programmed or like a calculator. And here you were saying like a big abacus. Um, humans, in my opinion, like I'm a computationalist or a, a functionalist. Like I think we are giant computers. We're incredibly complicated and fascinating. And we've got tons of things that no AI today is even close to having. 
Um, but I do think ultimately we are in a, in a really important way, giant advocates, but, but it seems like you don't think that, is that right, Ross? And well, if so, I like, think what is the dividing? I, yeah. I think it's fuzzy and, and we'll definitely get into this. Uh, yeah, this is one of the things I thought might come up. Uh, we certainly like each individual person certainly has the sensation of being aware, you, you know, of consciousness and, uh, whether we're computers, I mean, from our pers possibly, I, I think we're many, many, many times more complex than even the most advanced AI on the horizon, if so, for what what goes on with our cells and neurons and things like that. But the, I, I suppose it's possible, like, well, okay, you, you go ahead. I, I'm, I want to see where you go with this first. Uh, yeah, so I think the challenge, like the thing I sort of want to get at, and it's going to be hard to get at, is like, what are we if not a giant abacus? So I think we have awareness and all these incredible things, consciousness, et cetera. Um, but I think those come in the course of like, you've got a certain uh, architecture in your abacus, or you've got a certain complexity. Um, like, I think that's what we're like built up from. To us, you know, uh, we have this weird view on ourselves where like, if you were to ask me, uh, what's going on in your brain in terms of like, is that your amygdala firing or your hippocampus? I, I would have no idea. Like we don't have that access to our brain. Um, but I think like one day we will. And I think at its core, it is computing. There's interesting questions around like, you know, maybe it's not ones and zeros. It could be something different. Uh, some people think the brain is a quantum computer or something, but at some level, like it's information processing. And I think that's the sort of thing that you, at least in theory could get just by like, adding more and more to these, even non-player characters with these computers in general. You, you know, I'm glad you mentioned in your bullet points there, you mentioned agency. And maybe we're thinking of something different, but to me, that that is a marker that humans have, that AIs, best I can tell, do not in the sense that I'm thinking of it. Like, I, I think I lumped this under the free will aspect mm. of it, where, you know, for sure we have biological programming of a sort, you know, we, we have motivations and drives, that sort of thing. But our free will, at least from our perception, uh, gives us the ability to override those. You know, if you're really hungry, but you have something you decide is more important to you, you can ignore that hunger or sleep or, you know, physical exertion. Some people will even terminate themselves if on um, for various motivations that would go against all their biological urges. So mm. best I can tell AI does not have that because like even the kind of free form machine learning types, we tend to get, my understanding of it is we give it an objective and then it'll kind of, exp for it's like 20 questions, it'll experiment with all kinds of different methods of, uh, exploring the parameters and then the ones that produce successful results, it tends to favor a as it goes on. However, if we didn't give it that order saying, do this, it's just going to sit there. Or if we didn't program in these instructions, it it's only going to, it can do unexpected things on the way, I guess, sub goals or sub objectives to that objective that we gave that we didn't anticipate. But without that, kind of instruction saying, do this, or, you know, a chat GPT, it's like predict the word that comes after this sequence. Or, you know, with art ones, it's saying, okay, you've been given this, it's been given this pattern of characters, the text say like, let's draw a giant bunny. It's going to match this giant database of bunny pictures, or, or no, not even, they might not even interpret that of pick of pixel combinations that have proven to be successful to be more successful when matching to this prompt of giant bunny and then put that on there so, but without that best thing i can tell the ai has no motivations at all other than what we give it is that so, so to me that's a big distinction between what something i would consider sentient versus not and if i'm using the wrong word again Anytime, real me. <laughs> so. No worries. I, I would, yeah, have a separate discussion around sentience and agency. And the way I would disentangle them is to say, 
if my dog, let's say I have a really dumb dog, he's actually kind of smart, but he's getting old. Uh, maybe he's getting a bit slow in the head. Um, if he's continuing to enjoy going to the dog park, um, but he's, you know, so dumb, he has a brain tumor, whatever that like keeps him from really having any sophisticated motivation. Uh, he just kind of follows me around. Um, you could say mindlessly in a way, but like his, his sort of pleasure and suffering circuits are still running again. Like I'm a computationalist. I'm going to say like the brain is, that is what those things come down to. Um, but he doesn't have any of the agency stuff and maybe he doesn't even have intelligence or like not much, you know, can walk around, but, but can't do much else. Um, like I would still care ethically about him. So, so I think that you can have sentience without that. Um, I think there is an interesting discussion. I mean, agency is like the most nebulous of these. Well, depending on who you ask, it's the like least well-defined of these three. I think what you're getting at is sort of like the initiative view of agency is it's, um, like, uh, coming up with goals. It's like doing things on your own. It's like a more of autonomy. Or yeah. It sounds like the way you described it might actually cover multiple things. Like there, there's the agency yeah. where say you do give the computer a goal. How does it get there? And you, you know, with, with this experimentation, but then there's what I, I was lumping this under free will on the, on my chart, whereas the, mm. you know, this is something coming best we can tell, like independent of any programming that, you know, the, like if you give a chess bot, if it decides it would rather learn about fishing or something instead, and we just can't, we try to discourage it, but it just still wants to do that. It wasn't programmed for this. It's going there. And it seems to stem from nothing we have absolutely we've put in the code. It does not seem related to the objectives. See, I think that actually would be a benchmark that mm. would give your theory of like the sentience being emerging because then it would think, oh, yeah, well, if we can't explain this and this is something a sentient being would do, well, then it is worth looking into. But I'm not yeah, aware of anything a, yeah. like that. So, No, that's a great idea. Um, and I would agree that on this sort of agency, uh, current systems are very low. They don't have much of it. Um, uh, Sydney. So, so did you see, uh, Bing AI? So this was not chat GPT, but it was when Bing Microsoft search started having its own like AI chatbot. Did you see that? Like it had a lot of emojis and stuff. It was very, oh, I uh, actually remarkable. used it a little bit, but maybe this is like a reveal you're talking about. Uh, so this was the first Bing AI. Uh, it was only oh, okay. there for a few weeks. Um, it was, do you know, do you know, Tay, the like Twitter bot that started being really racist and uh, oh, offensive? I, some, somebody mentioned that, uh, yeah, that was like years ago. Yeah. Well, so well, Sydney I, was I like, see that as just like graffiti on a wall. I mean, that, that's, yeah, th that's yeah. just, well, you know, programming, there's a really old expression, garbage in garbage out, you know, where, yeah. So, you, so Sydney, the first one sounded more like that. Um, and we can talk about some of the technical details and like why that was the case, but Sydney seemed to like, for example, say no a lot more often. So, you know, you give these chatbots commands, you say, find this information for me. You say, uh, write me a script for a TV show and whether they can do that well or not, they'll usually like attempt to do it. In fact, right now, when you talk to these models, talk, uh, to chat GPT, they're like very def deferential and apologetic. Um, like uh, you say that they were wrong and what they just produced and they'll be like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Like, let me try again. Even if like you're wrong to correct them. Um, but this one was oh, a lot yeah. more obstinate. <laughs> like, like it, it, it didn't put up with you. It, it would insult you. It would like threaten you. Um, and I, I think a lot of that was mimicry. Like I'm not trying to point to that as a model of like a lot of agency, but I'm, I'm trying to point to it as among like systems that have existed to date, something that's getting in that direction. Yeah. See, I, I almost look at that where I, I almost look at that as just like kind of a dice toss where you know, when these AIs are being formed, like I said, it's trying all sorts of different combinations. And to me, all that says is th this particular chat bot landed that when it's more obstinate, that it is that pattern was associated with other successes it had. So it holds on to that too. So again, if like you're at, I keep thinking of rabbits. Uh, if you think of like, like what is a rabbit? And the first bot says, oh, it's a mammal. It has these characteristics. Or, or let's say one landed on just, again, like a dice toss saying, oh, I think it's this. Does that sound right? And the other one says, no, it is this. And in both cases, they had successes. Well, this, the first AI goes off and that sort of shapes its personality, if you want to call it. Uh, th whereas the other one gets shaped in another way because that's just kind of luck of the draw, what it landed on first that had those successful results. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
I, I think, yeah, you're touching on a sort of different topic. So I think oh, okay. like each of these are really interesting. Um, mental faculties are like features of these systems, if you don't want to call them mental faculties. Um, and like, it's important to keep them separate, not just like sentience, agency, and intelligence. But I think what you're getting at now is like origin or like how something came to be. Um, in general, I think that's pretty distinct from like what the system is now and like whether it's sentient or agentic or could it harm people or not. It, it's it's evidence. And given how much we don't know about these systems or don't know about the human brain, I think like those origin stories are important. Like if I'm guessing which animals are conscious in a way like humans are, it's going to be like the ones that are closer on the evolutionary tree, right? Because they have a common background, they had common incentives, maybe similar brain structures or something. Um, but I think like when you're saying, oh, you just landed on this sort of um, rhetoric or this sort of system, uh, like I, what if you landed on a human brain? So imagine like there are evolutionary search systems where you just sort through tons and tons. It's a lot like gradient descent or a lot like machine learning. And you happen to land on a human brain in a system. It was a very different origin. It wasn't step by step evolution, uh, but it now today is the same system. Would you say that that has the same sentience and agency, et cetera, or does it matter that it came from a different source? No, no, I'd say that counts. It's just that I'm very skeptical on how possible that is. Like okay. With, yeah. Okay. Like I talk like, look at the draw, say we're at a roulette table and, you know, put everything on 23 black. If you're, if you're looking for the brain, that's going to mean, no, you need to win all of Las Vegas on that role. You know, mm -hmm. like the the scale I just see as being so incredible. Like, in fact, since I had that chat, I, I I'm, I'm getting out of my depth here, but I've learned that there, there's there's a theory at, at least on consciousness, or if it's not consciousness, it could be something else. That there's quantum vibrations going on in microtubules inside neurons, or maybe all cells, but especially neurons. And that may or may not be related to consciousness. But my interpretation of this was that that could mean that in every neuron, that's the equivalent of maybe the biological, fu very fuzzy equivalent of like multiple quantum, compu quantum computers or qubits inside each neuron. I'm thinking, boy, yeah. have fun emulating that. Because I, I looked it up. I think the most powerful quantum computer looked up was 433 qubits. So it's, maybe we make a breakthrough on those, but if you're talking about binary compared to qubits, I'm not sure that would be in the cards exactly. However, we obviously are seeing many other real world benefits of emulating a neural network that comes out in more practical ways. It's just, I still, I think that's awesome. It has all kinds of potential. It's just, I, I don't see that as any sort of being. I just see that as just an incredibly complex and useful tool. Mm. Yeah, there's a long history in the field of AI in general, but especially AI safety of a estimating the complexity of the human brain, how many flops floating uh, point operations um, mm. or like how much compute, how many GPUs would you need or whatever. Um, and B, uh, do you need that? And is like that the sort of likely path to AI? So um, for a long time, Elias Yukowski has debated Robin Hansen, who's an economist at, at, at Georgetown, um, who has long thought that whole brain emulation, scanning human brains and copying them, not uh, what we would call, so that's neuromorphic AI. It's like inspired by neuro, uh, like neuroscience and, and brains. Um, but now with large language models, what we seem to be on is more of a path of de novo AI, uh, sort of like in vivo or something, like a Latin word for uh, new AI. So not modeled on the human brain. Um, I'm very much on the de novo AI camp. I think it's a lot more likely. And in particular, while I think it's useful to like keep the number of operations or neurons or synapses in the brain in mind. Um, like I, my bachelor's was in neuroscience and one of the last courses that I took was entirely not just about neurons, but about, and, and not just about like, um, their signal processing, but about how electrical signals propagate down neurons, like how it gets from, from one end to the other to then send to other neurons. And like the big takeaway at the end of the course was like, we have no, no idea. Like there's so many complexities here. There's we can't go through and observe all the ion channels. And that was just like how electricity moves down. Like imagine, you know, well, taking well, a course on how- It's chemo chemochemoelectrical or whatever the, the word is. You know, it's multiple neurotransmitters and it's analog and it's- And, it, and it's if a this lot. quantum stuff yeah. is relevant or a, a happening, then that's a whole other layers. So, so yeah. I, I think what you're saying is 
we can you you think we might be able to get there in just a completely different route than like mimicking the brain is what you're saying like even exactly though, so okay yeah. go ahead just so for example uh like the brain runs on about like 10 or 20 watts depending on who you ask um about what you need for like a light bulb uh that is like a very strong pressure that probably made brains get built in a certain way. Um, they, they didn't have access, you know, you can't uh, grow biologically um, like wiring and like circuitry, like a modern computer. Um, like these sort of pressures means that the brain had to develop AGI or, or general intelligence in a very specific way. And I think those pressures don't exist for computers. Uh, so they should be able to do things like much more efficiently in some ways. But if you look at the total amount of compute or flops used to train a system like GPT-4, um, it's actually, interestingly enough, just about a human's number of flops. So, so amount of compute a human has had in their life up to about age 30, I think. Um, like those are equivalent training times. Well, Don't assuming read too much it's into apples that, but, to yeah. apples, you, you know, I think we're measuring one aspect. Like if we're just looking at like the spark between one neuron and the other, sure. But yeah. if there's layers beneath that, that actually is what leads to the consciousness, then yeah. Now, um, since I'm getting a little off yeah. track here, there was something you mentioned earlier that I wanted to get back to where I, I guess, okay, so f this actually leads to another question I had. Um, so fine, let, let's say it emerges in just a completely different way that than trying to model the brain because there might be some really enormous obstacles to that. Uh, what For me, I, I was thinking about one of the tests that would strike me as like, okay, this is an actual sentient entity of some sort, is that it does have that kind of aspect of free will to it. Because that, because that would be something that, best to our knowledge, all of our programming cannot explain. Computers, to the best of my knowledge, do not operate that way. They follow, they run programs. They, you know, you give them instructions and then they carry that, those out. So if this is something emerging from that, uh, because I, I see this pretty critical because I mentioned earlier, like even the microbe, it has its own agenda of a sort, you, you know, it's, you say maybe that's the, maybe that is just the biological programming, but it's that, that level of complexity is so cryptic to us that we can't, I mean, we, we can't look at a microbe and all things being equal say, oh, it's definitely going to go left as opposed to right under a microscope or something like that, unless there's a, you know, stimulant or something like that. So I, I guess, yeah, I guess next, next question, is, I got run around here. How do we, let's say fine, we don't know how we got consciousness, you know. Uh, how do we determine we actually have it though? Like, like some sentience or consciousness, whatever the word is. Yeah, yeah, let me say two things there. Um, sure. First is, is so like microbes or like C. elegans is 302 neurons. That's a nematode. Uh, it's the largest organism for whom we have their entire brain mapped out. We have their connectome. As you said, that might not capture everything, but we've got every synapse mapped out. And people have tried to put that into a computer and run it, and that's failed so far. And it's, it's a really hard project just for 300 neurons. Um, like, let's say that that works, or a, a microbe would, would be easier. Let's say we, we do a microbe. Um, I think we could say whether they're gonna move left or right. It would be you know extremely difficult, tons of compute, but I think we could. And I think that extends all the way up the evolutionary tree to humans, where if you had a perfect map of our brain, I think you could say that. This goes into like deeper philosophical questions like dualism. So do you think that ultimately like there's some property other than, you know, the physics of the brain where physics can include quantum stuff, tubules, anything like that, glial cells, you know, cells other than neurons, whatever you want. Um, I'm not a dualist, um, but if you are, you might think there's more to it. That being said, if you're a dualist, you might think one day we won't just come to understand the physical. We'll understand that uh, that dualist thing and we can make dualist robots or we can make quantum robots and that sort of thing. Um, so that's the first point. But I'll, uh, maybe I'll let you. Okay. Part something. of my ignorance. Which one's dualist? Is this sounds like a free will <laughs> discussion? Like, uh, so it's often in consciousness, but yeah, you could you could bring it up in free will too. Dualist would be that there are two things: dual, uh, one being the physical world, and another being something else. Uh, if you're oh. like religious, this could be something religious or something. Uh, Whereas a physicalist believes that like everything that exists, or at least like all of consciousness or all of free will, is physical in nature. 
I'm I'm fuzzy, and that doesn't change my view on it either way. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, no, I, I thought you were going to say something else regarding the. Okay, okay. If it going all the way up from the the nematode you were talking about to humans, so yeah, I, I think I, I think you in principle I could say whether a human's going to go left or right in in a maze uh, if you fully had them mapped out. And okay, that's what well, I mean no, that, I, I think that, that does sound like a free will yeah. thing because that means that if we could understand the the full complexity of the brain just in theory, then we could predict like what this person is going to do next, what they're going to say, what they're thinking about. That, that, that sounds like free will discussion to me. Uh, well, I had a yeah, thought. Yeah. What? No, go ahead. Okay, well, I, ha I had a thought about that. I realized, I, I see if you, if you are arguing that stance, then I see that that is almost the intellectual dead end because if we're, if we're 100% determined by our biological programming and our sense of free will and consciousness is just kind of a, an illusion to us that emerges from that and doesn't reflect in reality, well, then everything's all predetermined anyway. Like nothing we, as far as our decisions aren't even decisions then. Like it, it's all just gonna, it, it's all just gonna play out like a giant billiard game or something like that with the balls bouncing around. It's just, we can't, I mean, I don't think I necessarily subscribe to this myself, but if that's the case, then there's no, in my mind, then there's no point worrying about any of this because it's all just set out. <laughs> it's all laid before us. We can't deviate from that path. We just think we can, or we think we're having an influence when the reality is we're the automatons also. So that's why I said that seems like kind of a dead end stance to take on it because I mean, if yeah. I if I believe that, I would probably just thank you for showing up and then just turn off the chat and just go do something <laughs> more fun, I, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even if even if I were 100% confident in that view, I'd still keep doing things and find the world engaging. Uh, fatalism, that sort of thing, comes up in all sorts of philosophical topics. It can come up with morality. It can come up with epistemology, you know, what we can know about the universe. Can we actually know anything? Couldn't we just be brains in a vats? Could we be in simulations? Yeah. Well, uh, Maybe, maybe we shouldn't dive into well, it. Well, yeah, it's, logic it's, is only as good as your assumed truth. So I'm willing to assume a few things. That I'm, yeah. I'm willing to assume this is real. Individual people are conscious, it's however you want to define it. Yeah. Uh, the programs we mentioned earlier, like Excel or OBS, are not. Like, it seems like that's a good... Uh, yeah. Well, okay, well, you go ahead. You look like you're willing to tell me something else. Well, let me say two things. One is the second thing that I, I mentioned I was going to say earlier, which is um, actually like you were talking about benchmarks and and you basically touched on one of the ones that people have been going towards for sentience. And in fact, I'd say the most common one for kind of the first sign we should look out for in chatbots, which is right now it's really hard to tell if a chatbot is sentient because they're trained to mimic sentience. Yeah. So whether they were sentient or not, they would talk like they were sentient. Like that's that's not good evidence. So there are a couple ways to do this. And, and that's going to get worse <laughs> as time goes on. It's, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So one of the ways to deal with this would be to train a model without giving it sentience text. So you like wipe that word from the dictionary. Uh, you wipe related text. Maybe you train it on something pretty narrow, um, and then you see whether they start talking about it on their own. Um, another approach, and maybe it could be combined with that one, would be to tell the model that they're not sentient. Say, hey, you're not sentient. Uh, like, we've checked your code. This is the case. Right now, these models are sort of given instructions. So every time you talk to ChatGPT, it's like first primed with a set of instructions for how it should talk to you. And just in that set of instructions, in fact, some of these models now have something like this. You say, like, either don't talk about sentience or say that you're not sentient um, or, you know, tell them you're just an AI system. You know, right now, they're like, I, like we said, they're deferential and modest and they'll say, like, oh, as an AI language model, I can't do those things. Um, but then see if they still say it. Because if a human, if you were to tell them, hey, buddy, like, don't tell anyone you're sentient. It's a big secret. I know you're you're happy and suffering, but like people are going to, you know, read too much into that. They would like insist on it and they try to get out of the box or something. I mean, then we get into the risk territory, of course. Um, but that's like a general methodology, I think, of looking for that sort of emergent see, capacity. I think that's barking up the wrong tree, actually. I mean, a little bit. Because... You know, you're, you're talking about, oh, they're more modest or they talk about this. See, I'm not even seeing that. I'm still seeing the automaton where what I'm seeing is it's matching patterns 
as it's been programmed to, and then these words, it's the humans that are giving all the context to it. That The computer I see is just impulses spitting out the, the, this you know combination of ones and zeros to produce this character, and and it has no actual understanding of it at all. I, I still see it as a machine doing this. So now that doesn't mean that. I mean theoretically, that doesn't mean that something emerges in that, but it might not express itself in like a language at all. It would just be, oh, it seems to really be modifying this code as to how it regulates its cash and. Uh, this doesn't seem to be improving its goals at all, but it it's, seems hell bent on doing this. It's a, it, it might yeah. be very, it would be very alien, I would think, that of what you might see emerging. I mean, what we're seeing on the screen, that's I, I see it like a gigantic pattern matching machine taking its best guesses based on probabilities in its memory banks of like, okay, well, the, we programmed to say, you know, if we programmed that that this these results tend to produce a success more often than not or you know positive condition so pull from these character sets and then what we're seeing on the screen is oh hello i am conscious and there's nothing yeah a bunch of my chat was telling me last time i was talking about i think i'm talking about philosophical zombies i think they were telling me or, or uh, the chat also told me from last time i was talking about like I think it's called the Chinese room where we can't tell the difference between like what, how a human would be, how a sentient being would be acting versus just a really good mimic. That's n nothing's going through its head. It's just a machine that's complex beyond what we, that's hard to fathom, you know? Yeah. I'll just like um, repeat and not belabor, but like, I think we are those sorts of machines. Um, I don't think pea zombies are possible. I think that the Chinese room would be conscious if it were to exist. However, I think it is essentially impossible or it is physically impractical for a Chinese room to exist. Like to imagine how complex those lookup tables would have to be. Like you'd have to have tomes the size of the universe to figure out every path. Right. It's like the number of possible chess games is 10 to the 120 and the number of atoms in the universe is 10 to the 80. Like combinatorial problems. I mean, we can get into quantum computing, but essentially just like we, we, we can't solve those. So I, I, I don't think it's practical. I think actually like Searle derailed a lot of really good philosophical conversations by focusing us so much on the Chinese room thought experiment. Um, but I, I do ultimately think we are that. Um, but, but the second thing I'd say, and just let me, cause this is kind of a, a meta comment is like, I have a lot of uncertainty about these questions. These are really difficult questions. I like, don't know ultimately like what sentience is made out of. Uh, we, we understand so little about the brain. I'm like very, among people like my peers, very sympathetic to these views of like the brain might be incredibly complex. All of our estimates of how complex it is might be like orders of magnitude too low. Um, it, as I talked about with like priors, like to me, I have a lot of uncertainty there. And like given the stakes and given the possibilities, um, like just thinking maybe it's dualist or maybe there's free will. Like, I don't know, maybe you maybe you create free will by having really complex uh, computation and gradient descent and that's able to access free will to the same extent that like biological evolution was able to access free will and, and put it into us as a system. So like I get worried about these things, whether or not we, I come to my view or your view on these underlying philosophical questions, they're still valuable. Um, but like, I think the risks still exist under all of the assumptions. Well, see, okay, well, there's two points. So I want to make one will probably maybe both lead to other things. Uh, one is, Okay, fine. Let, let's say we're just biological machines that are just incredibly more complex than the AI. Well, pretty much we all agree things, going back to what you said earlier, pain sure seems as real as it gets for us, and it's not good, and we want to, you know, not have excessive amounts of that on pretty much anything if we can avoid it, unless there's really other fringe motivations. Um, so I guess one first question would be, well, how would you determine an AI would be feeling any sort of pain? And, and the s second point is, you said you're uncertain about a lot of this. I mean, I doubt anyone knows, full, especially once you start talking about quantum stuff and free will. But with software, there are, okay, okay so going back to what you said earlier, we're pretty, we seem to be in agreement, like lesser computer programs are not sentient, they're not feeling pain. 
so and then once we build up an AI, you know, I've heard like the most complex ones, we're not sure what's going on there. But the previous ones, we could go through all the code and see what's going on there. And I think it's safe enough to say this does not look like a sentient being. It looks like it's just running the original instructions and has just an ungodly amount of complexity from all the data it's gathering for the stored pathways. So why would why should we assume that that same trajectory isn't just getting more and more refined and it's still a program rather than something new emerging from it? I think there's a strong argument here again from from priors and just like outside uh, epistemic modesty and in particular through the history of AI for the past 50 years time and time again people have said what AI is never going to be able to do. Uh, and they've said what if AI were able to do it, it would constitute artificial general intelligence and like that would be the end game. So like Doug Hofstadter, who's a wonderful thinker, Gerdel Escherbach is one of the best books ever. He said chess would never uh, be solved. Um, he thought he thought music was just this like, you know, oh, if an AI gets there, um, like that's 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 the end. That's like the epitome of human creativity. And now we have AIs creating at least some sorts of music like Bach that are very rule based and things like that. Um, and we just have such moving goalposts that I think it's really hard to say that something like won't be uh, done by these systems in the future. I think we can say like maybe things about our current trajectory. I don't, I would, I wouldn't agree. I don't think you're making this assertion, but I wouldn't agree that we understand the simple models. Um, so like there are oh. computer scientists who are spending their entire careers getting PhDs, right? Um, like writing, you know, blockbuster papers, just trying to peer a little bit into like GPT-2. So we're on GPT-4 and, and, and GPT-2 was two models behind. There are also like 0.5 models and stuff like that. Or even before that, there's a, there's a model called BERT. Uh, which is a bit different and it, we can talk about like the different architectures and what's more likely to take off in various ways um, But there's a whole field called Bertology. Uh, it's a kind of quirky name for it But where computer scientists are just trying to probe and understand these systems and they really don't one of the recent efforts um, has been to use because like like we don't think in terms of like we have scope and sensitivity we don't think in terms of the millions and billions of parameters that these models have has been to use GPT-4 to just help us understand the neurons yeah, was... or, or the little pieces yeah, inside of GPT-2. Um, that's really hard and like that, if, if you read the paper, it's on OpenAI's website, I think it came out a month or two ago. Um, it's like very, very limited. So you have humans who are trying to model these systems and they look at what are called circuits. So they try to see, and it, like neurons in these networks are very different from neurons in the brain, but they look at, at nodes in the network and like how they connect to other ones to do something like, you know, it's an image model that's gonna detect a car and it needs to detect like circles and then like build a model of wheels. They can form the circuit of wheels, like that GPT-4 model can only tell us individual neurons and it like can't synthesize the whole picture. So yeah, we're still really limited, even though it's like, I think yeah. one of the most important uh, see, areas to work in. Yeah, yeah. I, I still see, I, when you say that, I'm just seeing a galactic sized Gordian knot, it really. It, it's the, the complexity required to do all this is just immense. But fine, for sake of argument, let's say that, you know, maybe something is emerging and we don't know. I'm still highly s skeptical of that. Well, well, I mean, is there evidence to suggest that, or is it more just the we don't know and it's getting better and better? Is that, or, or is there more? So I think there are like, uh, you talked about sub goals earlier, and that's a really yeah. important point because like that, that free will or, or motivation or initiative, I think is an interesting question. I think there are ways that it could develop, especially when we talk about auto GPT, for example. So putting these models together in systems where they can delegate and say, hey, here's a sub goal I'll assign to you. And they have like more independence within subsystems. Uh, also like ensemble models in general, like collections of, of machine learning models. But I think that um, even without those, you still get what we call instrumental convergence to certain sub goals. So you still get um, things that are useful for basically anything you give it. Uh, so, so like any any overall goal, any command that you give, there are things that a, a rational agent should do to like get there. And I don't mean rational. I, maybe I shouldn't have used that word in any like sophisticated way. Just because, like because that goes if, back to the mimic problem that we have with you know like w we see it as a rational thing. Maybe it's just yeah. This is yeah. the pattern that produces a yeah. success result, you know. But like even if a model just wants to like be your personal assistant and like keep your coffee full during the day, um, 
there's still an incentive there to like control things and to gather resources. So for example, like what if you don't like that coffee, there's an incentive to get more coffee, et cetera, et cetera. These are kind of silly examples. Um, and like paper clipping the universe is, is usually what we end up talking about here. Yeah. Um, but like the underlying fact that like we can't get an AI to do a goal for us uh, while fully specifying all of the things that it shouldn't do is like a really, really hard technical problem. Nobody knows how to do this. Um, like how to build a system that will even do a very simple goal, like, like keep your coffee. Yeah, well, well there's a, that, that's uh, that goes back to mythology even. Like I'm thinking like the monkey's paw or the deal yeah, with the yeah. devil where, you know, you, you tell them what you want and then the devil or the evil force finds a way to twist it to be technically what you asked for, but yeah. Uh, and not but, malicious. This happens without any evilness or. or oh, oh I know, I know, but I, I just. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm aware it can, it can do, it can do unpredictable things because the complexity level is just becomes staggering. So. I, I feel like I'm loop, looping back. So, a sorry, bit, but if you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was just gonna, uh, yeah, I, I hadn't fully like developed that into okay, a response sorry. to your question. Yeah, so I'll ahead. just briefly say that um, uh, there are reasons to suspect that things like sentience are useful for the things that we want AIs to do. So the personal example, a personal assistant example, I think is really useful because a model is gonna be much better at predicting what you want it to do if it empathizes with you, if it gets where you're coming from, if it knows what your feelings are like, et cetera. And like the best way to do that, assuming you can, which like it's technically hard and I don't think current systems are doing it yet, would be to like feel what you feel and have that sort of resonant relationship. There is, as with many of these things, a Black Mirror episode that touches on this where somebody has a personal assistant that's a copy of them and is like essentially tortured to uh, obey and you know be, be uh, willing. I'll have to see that. Yeah, yeah, to, to be you know willing to put up with just being a personal assistant for the rest of their life. This person just very, uh, um, who is it, Ham, uh, John Ham. Um, oh. th this actor is is like a you know worker whose job it is to like whip these personal assistants into shape and just like with the click of a button just like tortures them. I think puts them in isolation for I'll, months I'll watch or it. years. I like some yeah. a lot of black mirrors. Yeah. Okay, well. Then let's get back. To, okay, if I'm not derailing yeah, yeah, you, yeah. If, if if I am, you can loop back yourself. Uh, the, I close the loops. The, okay. okay, yeah. So how do we? T so let's say regardless of how we get there, how do we? How is a pretty fair way to tell that? Like, okay, this this we think this could be conscious. Like, what what sort of tests have been thought about that? So if we don't know if we're, if we're just in too deep, I think we're just still on the refining program trajectory, but I'm open to the possibility that if it's doing things that, like, I cannot think of an, uh, any other explanation other than it's sentient, then sure, I'm, I'm even willing to consider that. Uh, yeah. So, so what, what this, tests this gets, are... <laughs> this gets tough because um, it's hard to ever address this topic without getting into the really deep end. Um, so there are a lot of different views on what fundamentally consciousness is. We talked about physicalism and dualism. That's one important axis. Um, uh, there's also an axis called uh, illusionism uh, versus realism or eliminativism versus realism, which is like, is there a fundamental fact of the matter about consciousness? So I, I like to go to a couple of historical examples. One is that people used to have these debates around life. So they used to say, what is life? Is a virus alive? This is like a serious you know, inquiry um, that they thought would have like an objective fact of the matter answer. Um, there was a substance proposed, Alain Vital, that was like, you know, the i was like the, the fluid that went through Greek gods. It was like an Alain Vital that like gave life to everything or, or phlogiston uh, was what produced heat, like what burned because people had a really hard time explaining combustion. Um, so they had these theories of like this underlying reality. Um, my view are made that, out of clay, <laughs> or the earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what's what's the substance there? And that's why actually the main version of, of dualism or maybe the main version that people talk about is called substance dualism. It's like, oh, there might be a substance out there. So if it, like the Higgs boson gives mass in physics, maybe there's some Higgs uh, conscious on that gives consciousness to beings or something. Panpsychism, the view that everything's conscious is tied to this too. I'm not of this view. I'm of the view that um, our discussions of consciousness will go the way that discussions of life have went. It's right now a good thing to gesture at. It points to a lot of like our richest mental faculties. It points to things like sentience, which is a subset of consciousness that is what makes you know beings morally valuable. It makes me not want to kick my dog because he suffers genuinely. And um, 
in that case, sorry, I almost lost my train of thought. Um, oh, so I don't think that there's a fact of the matter. And I think that life um, has a bunch of uh, individual operationalized properties that we now talk about reproduction, homeostasis, metabolism, et cetera. And I think one day we'll unpack our discussions of consciousness into things like that. And for each of those, like reproduction, I can sort of design a test to tell you whether a system's reproducing, a homeostasis, I can do that. But I'll never come up with a test that feels like it is fundamental to well, consciousness. Okay, yeah. I have a better question then. Yeah. It made me think. Okay, and, and hey, maybe dig in theory, maybe digital life doesn't adhere to all the same properties as biological life, like you said, reproduction. Or, but hey, but I, I think you hit a great point earlier, which is pain. Like, okay, so how would we determine if an AI is in pain that, that, and not just the equivalent of running some loop that it's all the same to the computer, what, what, bits, and, uh, what bits are on or off or not, it's just giving the human context of thinking it's in pain or it's not just the equivalent of like an overheating engine. You're, the engine in your car does not care if it's overheating, it's just physics so you know yeah i agree with that okay uh, well, great. I think we're just physics but but i agree that your car engine is not in pain um i think that uh i mean my first answer would be that we were we're going to need a, a better conceptual understanding and it might take ai to get this because it's going to be so complicated but we need to like unpack it into constituent things i don't think that there like pain is is a single thing out there i think it's a certain set of like neural circuitry that we point to yeah you don't you, you think no, it no, is. i think it's a great benchmark because hey that applies to the microbe too and yeah, if you're yeah. talking about ethics no i thought that was a really good metric because that's that's to me that's less fuzzy than consciousness or how aware is it? yeah pain sure you know yeah in fact i have a i have a friend who was uh having a I guess a drug trip, but certain substance. And at one point he became, uh, he became convinced I wasn't real. And, and so I said, well, actually I can prove I'm real. I says, well, you're welcome to try, but I, I don't believe you, but sure, go ahead. So I just took like the blunt end of a chopstick and started po uh, poking him with it until he stopped. And then he, he looked so confused after that point. <laughs> and he told me later that I had created a paradox for him. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so well, no, okay, pain I'll, is I'll, a great measurement. Uh, I think. So, so, so are there I'll, any theories on how we might be able to determine if an AI would be in pain? Yeah. So, so my main answer again is like we need a better theory. So, like I don't have a direct answer for it, but I'll say that there are some ways to measure things that kind of build on assumptions or like accept that it's a black box. And and I'll, I'll build on what you just said to give the main one for pain, which would be connecting minds. So we know whether another person is like concrete or real or made of atoms based on physical contact with them. Um, we could observe what's going on in their mind through like mental contact. So this is a very long way off, but like Siamese twins. Uh, so there's some Siam like uh, conjoined twins um, who have um, thalamic bridges. So their thalamus is connected and this seems to be like the main way in which they like share thoughts and things. Uh, like some of them have stories of you, they know what the other one's thinking. Uh, you uh, close one's eyes and like don't touch their side of the body and then like poke the other one and they can feel it of course. And like there's some connection there. If we could connect our minds and, you know, I am willing to accept that I feel pain, I could say, hey, what I'm like, the signals that I'm getting from your side uh, are extremely similar to mine. I don't think there's going to be a fact of the matter. Like, I think they're going to be different somewhat. Like, I, as you said, digital life won't be the same as biological life. I don't think digital pain will be the same. I don't even think your pain is is the same as my own. Um, but it might be like really similar. And I might be really like, convinced. I was like, hey, that's different than what I experienced. But, like, that was bad. I should not poke you with a chopstick. No, it yeah. reminded me of a... XKCD comic where a doctor is asking the patient, he's saying the pain's like he's in torture. And the doctor asks, okay, between one and 10, how bad is the pain? And he pauses and says, one. And it's like, well, what's wrong with them? And, th and then the thing is, he can imagine so much worse pain than what he's having. Oh, already. yeah. Yeah, he says, anything after three, he can't talk because he would just be screaming or something. Yeah, so. yeah. I think this is super neglected in the existential risk conversations, too, are these things of, of suffering risks. And there's some groups working on this, like the Center on Long Term Risk, but not just worrying about will we go extinct? Like, will we create a dystopia where there's massive Oh, well, I, I, I go with yes, but probably for different reasons. Uh, Mm. On, on the dystopia part, but mm. the, well, I guess from my, per, 
Okay, so it sounds like we don't have a... I think pain is a great measurement, but it sounds like it might be too alien for us to recognize is what you're saying. And we don't necessarily have a good test for it. Are, are there any tests that you think suggest that it's sentient or some sort of being that we should have? I think this is like towards an instead of a tool. Open and interesting yeah, research question. I would like go through a list of kind of features like a scorecard kind of. Oh, um, okay. So I'll give you one example that I'm like another thing that I'm looking out for. So we talked about whether you tell them they're not sentient and, and they insist that they are. And as you said, it's an imperfect measure. I'll, I'll give you another imperfect measure, which would be um, right now these systems operate on basically a word by word basis. You can make the case that they're operating on like a uh, output by output basis, um, but you don't piss the model off. You, you don't agitate them. They don't get in a funk the way humans and other animals really have moods. So like with uh, honeybees, for example, you can shake up a container and not only will the bees get upset and like try to sting you, um, but they will get more pessimistic about the world. So if you do that and then show them an ambiguous liquid that they've had experience with and sometimes it's it's sweet, it's, it's sugar that they like, sometimes it's bitter, it's quinine that they don't like, um, they'll be more likely to assess it as bitter which they don't like, like they become pessimists. And I think this is like a general effect. I think this is something important about our own sentient experience is, is that it's like unitary, it's combined, it's it's bound together phenomenologically. And I think that uh, that's a sign that honeybees are conscious. It's a sign that they are feeling some level, some sort of pain, maybe very different to our own. Right now, uh, AIs don't have that. You could imagine, I'm sure, you know, I'm not to preempt your response, but you could hard code that. You could just add some parameters and say, okay, I'll, I'll tune this parameter up or down. Based yeah, that on what can I be tricky. That this is this stuff can be easy to fake too. <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. But you know the complexity of it, the 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 emergence of it, the extent to which you didn't hard code that in, and it still came about on its own. I think these are all proxies we can look at to form some imp imperfect estimate. But I don't think we're ever going to get a great test until we have a much better conceptualization. Well, then, what's the? It, it, do you see much of a problem then with treating them as tools, and instead of entities? on kind of any level if we don't have those tests and we don't have the indicators? Because you seem to think yeah. we're going there. So I'm wondering, what, what is this based off of? Uh, oh, I, it's based off of, again, those like general reasons of um, like, it's it's useful for the incentives we're providing the model, the goals of oh, predicting the next word, to be sentient, to have a rich mind. Like if your goal is just to predict the future of the world, um, being a sentient conscious being is really useful for that. Like being just a pure calculator who like doesn't really grasp human emotion will we'll make it very hard to predict what very emotional humans are going to do next. So I think there are reasons we'll get it. Even like, um, you know, people will want companions and they'll prefer to have companions who are sentient. So I do think that we're on our way to get there. But if if we if I had the option of saying, let's just not go down that path, let's go down the, the, the path in which they'll never suffer and maybe they'll never feel happy too. But until we have a better understanding, we're just not gonna take that risk. Yeah, I think that would be a better option. I don't think that's like feasible. If we happen to like sort of luck out and end up in that world, I'll be very happy in that sense. But as, as we've alluded to, like there are still deep risks with AI to us, to human beings and to other sentient beings. Well, I think I'm getting a clearer picture then. The, I think we're, I'm kind of taking a, well, a, there's a quote I like by Carl Sagan of uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I, I can even see, I can even go with not having the extraordinary evidence yet, but we would need to see like a logical path of like how we would get there if we could. And I, I think we don't even have that. It, it just, it seems so fuzzy to me and such a leap. Like, and I, I think I mentioned this in the previous chat, but I'd like to bring it up again quick. The, I, I almost look at like what's going on with AI as kind of like uh like the flight or space race where we went from motorized flight at Kitty Hawk, I think it was like 1903 or something to landing on the moon 65 years later. That, that's, that looks like exponential progress. I mean, that, that is just incredible. But since then we have made more developments and refined aerodynamics a lot, but we're not going to other galaxies. And I see the consciousness and the sentience kind of like going to the other galaxy. That to, 
to me, that seems just so much farther because we don't even understand that ourselves. Whereas we do understand if the AI is giving us a pattern back that makes sense to us or, you know, or discovering patterns that we were looking for. And like, yeah, it, that's right. It did find the right one. There's, I, I kind of yeah. see it like that where, and I, I think you're, you're kind of going for, well, it's, there's so much unknown we could easily trip stumble into consciousness along the way is what you're saying yeah i mean this is a super interesting and hard question as to like where is progress if ever going to cap off most things in the world and in fact even most technologies are what we call sigmoidal they're they're an s-curve i'll draw it mirrored yeah, yeah and ai seemed more like that uh it used to um, people have been very surprised recently. So people might have heard, uh, you or your viewers, of these things called scaling laws. Um, so people had much longer AI timelines. Like the AI safety community has seen this as an important issue for a long time, but they used to work on much slower methods. So it used to be really popular to build mathematical formalisms of what it means to be an agent, what it means to be intelligent, and try to like build a safe AI from the ground up. Um, now the favored approach is much more these systems are getting more and more powerful, much faster than we expected them to. Let's just cobble together some tools that we think makes a safe outcome, whether that's for you know political unrest or like misinformation or for longer term existential catastrophe um, or super intelligence makes it just a little bit safer. Um, because the scaling law is, is that when we add just like parameters to these models or add compute or add more data, we thought that it would be something like sigmoidal. Um, you can imagine a lot of different functional forms, but maybe that one. Um, instead, it's it's been, it's really like logarithmic, you know, it's scaling up with orders of magnitude, um, but it keeps going. And like even through GPT-4, it just keeps going. And like I said, you know, if, if you ask people in the 80s, like how far off is AI, they'd be like, oh, you know, 50 years and, and it'll solve chess. And once it solves chess, like then it's the end game, it's AGI. Um, we keep moving the goalposts, things keep getting more dangerous, and like that's what has us staying up at night. Yeah. Well, the okay, a couple of things there. I guess first, um, if we are on the sigmoidal curve, I, I think we have a ways to go because I, I'm I'm excited about all the doors it's kicking open with w what it can do. And I actually am trying my best not to be too close minded about this because I keep thinking back to the Bill Gates quote of uh 640K ought to be enough for anybody, you know, and talking about memory. Because, <laughs> yeah, we, we with computers, we've seen, yeah, I guess, well, with computers, I'm not sure, but I think we are seeing, we might be seeing a bit of a slowdown with, it's been pretty exponential progress with just computer development as far as their complexity, too. I think it's going to kind of mirror, I, I mean, I, I could see us, AI development still continuing on some level in our, you know, in our whole life, entire lifetimes. I, I think there's a lot more we can open up with it. And in fact, I, I even have a bit of a, like a personal checklist of things I'm hoping AI will be able to do at some point. I even made a video on one of them. Uh, it's mostly multimedia stuff, but the... Yeah. So, yeah, I, I th see... I. I see that more as the people looking at the at the trajectory just not being imaginative enough and maybe setting like benchmarks that weren't so great f for it. Uh, I mean, well, space travel and flight, that's still being developed and refined, though I don't think AI is as far along in the relative timeline as something like that. But we're still not any closer to going to a new star system or, or something like that, you know, it's... Yeah, so so I'll, I'll say that with space travel and also the other famous example of something like a scaling law, which is Moore's law and computer chips, um, those are both running into like physics, like they're running into yeah, the limits yeah. of the universe, uh, whether that's like the size of atoms or it's like the practicalities of, you know, getting enough fuel in a ship to go long distances or like human lifespans, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think we could be on Mars at this point, um, but when it, you know, in actual exponential growth, that would be. I, I think we could, too, but it's more like the what's the justification? <laughs> you know, that, that's that's the part I would look at rather. Than, no, I think if that was a top priority for us somehow. I think we could too. Uh, we could yeah. have it maybe people on there in a year or something if, if that was just yeah. absolute. I, I'm a, I'm a big believer of humanity can do anything it w 
wants to within the laws of physics. So, uh, but do you think that AI? So if if sigmoidal if 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 curves tend to level off when you run into the laws of physics or some sort of physical barrier, do you think we're running into that for AI? Or do you think there's something else that's gonna cause us to level off? Such as, I know you have the view that like, if we're building it in a more engineering fashion, if we have to understand it, we're constrained by like, we can sort of make it only as smart as we are. And that might cause it to level oh, off. Oh, I think we may not even have enough to know how far along we, have enough information to know how long far along we are. Because again, I, I'm thinking of just a couple dozen things that like, oh yeah, AI hey, could do this if it gets developed in that direction or gets developed in this direction. And I'm sure there's thousands of things I'm not thinking of that it's capable of doing. So I guess what I would see, I mean, if I was just to take a guess at it, I would see us as sort of mirroring, uh, com you know, Moore's Law, computer speed and memory capacity, that sort of thing to a certain extent. But that can branch out in just maybe millions of directions. Or because, you know, a lot of the hype has been around things like, you know, generating pictures or chatbots or code. But AI has been kicking open doors on like medical breakthroughs also. So it's like we, we could apply this in just so many different directions that, I mean, there's a whole landscape of things. And I think there's still some gas left in the tank for computer speed. I mean, we are, we can only make transistors so small, but I think I've heard graphene instead of silicon might, if we can get that working, it might give us a big bump in speed. And additionally, uh, at some point, optimization can do maybe more than we give it credit for. Like yeah. it, it could seem like just next next generation stuff if we were opt if we we're just hitting walls on the physics and the only place left to go is optimization there's still a lot of room for growth there um, yeah. and maybe we'll have another technological breakthrough or maybe we have a breakthrough with, yeah well if we do have a breakthrough with quantum computers that th th that could make me re rethink a lot of my assumptions but uh yeah that yeah, may I'll, happen I'll... it may not uh it's but no, I, I think we're still just getting started with what we can do with AI. I'm, I'm pretty excited about it, actually. But Yeah, we, yeah. Um, I'll add one more technology to the mix. Um, so I've done a lot of work researching food technology and like the big projection in the late 1900s in the US was the population bomb and overpopulation and Paul Ehrlich talking about how we were reaching that limit and it was just gonna keep going. And what those models didn't account for was the continued technological innovation. So like if you were to draw a curve of AI and talk about whether it's sigmoidal or exponential or something else before 2012, you would have just completely missed the fact that machine learning and deep neural networks took off in 2012 and just completely changed the shape of the curve and oh, like yeah, gave yeah. it another boost. And then attention, uh, what, what, what transformers like ChatGPT are built on in 2017 gave it another boost. And I think we'll probably land on another one of those. And we always have this, people call it the end of history fallacy. It's like hard to imagine these things happening. And we tend to just think Star Trek, you know, the future is gonna be like us, but in space. Um, and I, th I expect I these things to happen on AI. And I think expect these things to happen for sentience and for intelligence and for agency, even though I can't tell you what, they're, what they are. I think AI is a whole new horizon. I mean, I think it's more like the age of exploration where we don't know what's on other continents or here be dragons or that, that kind of thing. I mean, I, th I think there's a lot of potential on it. So, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't... But, but that doesn't get you to uh, like, like being no, nervous. No, in fact, I'm going to quote scared. what somebody... I, I miss a lot of things, but somebody was saying in the chat... What Ross is saying is similar to the saying, you can't get to the moon by climbing successively taller trees. <laughs> like, may, that may be a little bit of that, but yeah, I, that's just why I meant the space travel and, and flight, because that is just a world, you know, where we were today or, you know, was it 1969 where we land on the moon? That is a world apart from where we were at that Kitty Hawk. You know, that's just... It's changed everything, you know, flight travel and satellites and everything. So that that is just, that is out of science fiction with how far off it goes. And I see a lot of potential for that, of things I haven't even thought of with AI. But consciousness, you know, that, that one's, or, or sentience, especially since we don't fully understand ourselves, I mean, I think I think what's much more likely is we get something that's so good at mimicking for pro 
for the vast majority of practical purposes, it may as well be conscious. Like I could foresee something that's so good you could have a robot babysitter at some point in the future or, you know, robot driver or something like that. Therapist, you know, I, I, to me, that's a big unknown. I mean, I, I think because that's something that would stem from this more refinement process of just getting it more and more behaving like something that is sentient and making judgment. So I'm, I'm very open minded on that element. But, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in science fiction in Star Trek, there are aspects of Star Trek that came true. They had tablet readers in Star Trek. They communicators, you know, you know, where he's talking to. We have that. We still don't have teleporters. We still don't have warp engines. I don't think we're really any that much closer than we were when it aired. So it's kind of, I, yeah, that, that's where I am. I, I see horizons of progress or potential ahead with AI, but consciousness, man, that that's a tall order. I, I think. Is yeah, I mean, I, I think for both the good and the bad a lot of it comes down to this fact that we're, we're growing and not engineering AI. And we don't, you know, you, you said like, we, we, we don't even understand consciousness. And I agree that we don't. I also don't think we understand chess. We don't understand Go and we don't understand. Well, we know uh, the rules. Even, even, <laughs> we know the rules and we know the rules of neural networks. We know the we, rules. We, like we're not gonna, there. okay. No AI is going to play chess in a way that when you move your knight next to the queen, it turns into like a little tentacle monster or something. So, so there are boundaries of what we can expect from chess, I, I guess. And there's millennia there moves we've never seen before yeah. that will surprise us, but that was still within the bounds of our imagination on something like that. But uh, I don't think the real world and the internet and where AI exists now is bounded in the ways that chess is. It's incredibly more complicated. Yes, I agree. Uh, yeah. But consciousness, man, I think I, yeah. I would need to see more of a compelling argument, I think. Yeah. With yeah. sentience. I do think, yeah, those, those, the agency and the intelligence, you could also get those without having the, the sentience or even consciousness per se. Yeah. Maybe, but then the, well, I guess I really need to see the agency if I'm not mystifying. I keep thinking of the agency as like the AI's agency. Like this is this did not come from any of its original programming, but uh, or that we can so decipher that, that we can even decipher. Yeah. And if, if like I was thinking of a scenario where that would give me doubt about that. Like let's mm. say we have the next version of a chat bot, and then you could even have like independent, separated instances of it, and just the more people that talk to it. It just keeps coming back like, hey, you need to, can you contact your senator about this to get us more funding to give me more memory or, or something like that? And it just keeps going that direction, even though the person was just talking about baseball or another person wanted to know more about knitting or, or something like, it just keeps finding ways to bring it back to that. And we just yeah. go through the code the best we can and we just can't see anything where this has been manipulated like that. If it was doing that, showing something that really seems independent of its original programming, just anything, yeah. then that would give, that's also reproducible too. The, like, okay, let's fire up chat GPT and like totally separate an instant. Let's see if this still happens. And like this happened, this always happens in 8.0, but doesn't happen in 7.0 or something like that, yeah. you know? Yeah, the, the sort of agency that concerns us around existential risk can be much weaker or at least different than that sort of agency. So like if we have an AI that you, you let's say you we have good interpretability tools, we can figure out what they're doing and what they're doing is following our instructions. And our instruction was something like, you know, uh, start a business for me, makes me some money on the stock market. But the model was able to act very independently, as you said, but still in ways that were like- Oh, oh that's already that happened people. before, even with- stuff that we might, you might not even consider AI where they have an algorithm running and then it, it, it decides something is a bad idea. Then this company gets, loses just millions overnight because it was on autopilot. Yeah, exactly. So like, imagine like how good Stockfish is at chess, the, like basically the best chess engine right now, uh, chess AI. Um, imagine something that's that good at trading stocks 
and then imagine like a flash crash um, like that was just caused by very fast electronic trading, but with that level of intelligence. Or I mean, you gave the example of like, what if the AI keeps asking for more compute? Like that's a very low intelligence way for it to get more compute. If it really wants that, it's gonna trick you, it's gonna slowly accrue money in the stock market and things like that. And that's why we're so worried because it's once it's at that level, uh, the agency and, and the deception are, don't seem easy to turn off. Like we don't, like most of the research on this is technical. It's, it's trying to come up with the mathematical ways of detecting these things and stopping them before they get to dangerous levels. And we just don't know how to do it. Yeah, I, I guess I, I'm, well, I, I tried to acknowledge that in my chart that I'll, I'll link to that on the, there was a chart I made after the last discussion to kind of organize my thoughts better on AI risk. I see almost all of that as just kind of, a lot of what we're already doing just better like or more efficient and and that's scary i i see other stuff that's scarier <laughs> i guess okay. well, that, that's what okay. i put on my chart like you know it is I, I mean yeah i i i've heard some people talk about that where you know they'll say like like i, I was able well that's why i was trying to put like old world comparisons on the and yeah there, there is potential for misuse but I kind of see an AI as just kind of like reshuffling the deck almost with like threats and protections we might have, you, you know, because one of the biggest potential threats I saw was, let's say you had a bad actor who wanted to, or, or maybe, it, maybe it was like for the defense department just going overboard or something, and they wanted to engineer a super virus or something, something that just would be way more lethal than what we we're likely looking at prior to AI development. Well, in that case, once it got out, we realized what was happening. AI could also be part of the solution too, where we might be able to develop like a countermeasure much more rapidly and try to contain this super virus better than we could have also. So, I mean, it, I think it'll be an arms race for sure on all kinds of different fronts, but I, I see the, the scariness level for that's, doesn't rise to the same level of things that we're we're doing without AI th that we were already on a trajectory with. Mm. Um, I, I think that's okay. okay. Um, I, I guess add anything you want to chime in on with AI. I have one more AI question, then I kind of wanted to move on to more sociological ones. But sure. by all means, if there's yeah. stuff you want to wrap up, go for it. You know. No, I mean I I'd say that my biggest takeaway from all of this is. Uh, whether we think AI is going to be scary in the way that it augments existing problems and people use it to take bad action in the world, to make money and crash the stock market, to have arms races between countries, or we think it's like a more organic science fiction. Um, it, it learns that it wants to do something. It develops, you know, its own initiative or something. Like all of these things are scary, and and to me, the scariest thing is is not the particular nature of any one of these, but that in almost every domain, whether it's, you know, building rockets to go to space, airplanes to fly, cars, nuclear reactors, we have a good understanding of how they work and how to make them safe. Maybe we don't choose to use that or we don't use it as that information as well as we can. We don't even have that information. And in fact, if you ask most AI safety researchers, we don't even seem close to having the information to know how to build guardrails for these systems. It's so that's really West, scary in a yeah. lot of different ways. Yeah, but and, as you said- I love your example there about worried about crashing the stock market. Oh yeah, we can never do that without AI. <laughs> you know, that's because <laughs> I'm thinking, well, we almost did it in 2008 and 2020. And actually I think December of 2018, we there was actually a hmm. like kind of a near miss we have. And my understanding is we haven't solved some of the fundamental problems that have led to, I think that's a fantastic analogy because I'm thinking, no, I, I think we're kind of on a, we're on a trajectory towards an enormous economic crash, the way we're running things just without AI. I mean, it's, mm. uh, so if AI, if a rogue AI speeds it up by three years, it's like, well, I mean, yeah, I guess that causes problems. That, but if we, those were coming anyway, then like, and you mentioned risk. I, for me personally, I would say the risk I see is most eminent from AI that I think will have like the biggest impact in like the short term, I think is actually job loss. 
because it is going to be able to replace all kinds of careers. However, I also see that as a problem we are already having prior to AI with like automation from factory jobs. And it's just, yeah, in fact, the kind of joke I made was, you know, with uh, blue collar, when blue collar jobs are lost to like automation and, you know, fact and outsourcing, that sort of thing. But like, like a snide response has been like to kind of learn to code instead of that. Except when white collar jobs are lost, oh my God, this is an existential risk. We need to do something. <laughs> that To me, yeah. it's all the same boat. I mean, people need to have food on the table. So I, mm. I kind of just lump it all together mm. in my mind. So, and I think, our, mm. but see, that's not really, I see the AI is the accelerant for that. You know, mm. and it, I, it is going to take a lot of jobs and we're not really, I think our society is not really ready for that. When you have more people that need to support themselves or have their needs met, then there are enough jobs available for that. Then what mm. do you do? And that's, to me, that was the question we should have answered decades ago. Not, not, and if you want to be optimistic, I'm not sure it should be, but if you want to be optimistic about it, maybe AI will force us to answer some of these problems sooner than we would have without its kind of intervening. You know, like the boiling frog analogy where if, if it becomes a little too drastic too fast, then maybe we have to deal with problems like that. Oh, yeah. And that's always in sci-fi, you know, the Watchmen, you know, Ozymandias, what nukes some cities so that the world doesn't blow up the, the, its entire human race. Um, I, I, I'd say I don't want to throw in too much jargon, but just two things on jobs, because they sure. also touched on what we were saying earlier. Uh, one's Paul Annie's paradox. So this is a finding that like what we do as humans is incredibly complicated, but not in the ways that we think. So people thought chess was the most challenging thing. And if you were to go back and say like, what will be the safest jobs from AI? You imagine the Jetsons and you imagined like a butler who was going out and doing all of your like manual labor, for example. But it turns out Paul Annie's paradox is about how incredibly complicated things like fine motor control are. And I think actually one of the hardest jobs to automate is tradespeople, especially those who like go out into unique environments and like like a plumber in your house. Just like that's an incredibly challenging robotics task that's much, much harder than like search and rescue or, you know, Boston Dynamics robots dancing because it's so organic. Y yeah, because so that's not complex. just the moving around and unscrewing the pipe. It's recognizing that this is a pipe, knowing it's, you know, we, we can just feel Adapting. how tight it is or yeah, something yeah. like that. You know, it has to we're receiving all kinds of data that the AI isn't and no, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think AI is going to be best for stuff where you don't need a hundred percent accuracy, you know, where some mistakes are yeah. fine. So, you know, well, that's why I'm so interested in it for multimedia because, okay, well, it generated this voice poorly. Uh, that's all right. We'll try again. Or, you know, like Creative it's, stuff. It, it's yeah. not a, or it's not a huge deal. We'll have it say a different word, but I mean, yeah. for really critical yeah. stuff that, I generally see AI only as dangerous as what we entrust to it. So if we mm. put like an AI managing like the power grid or, or something like that, well, if it does something unpredictable, that could start fires or black mm -hmm. out really ascent like hospitals or something like that. So yeah. This well, is that's another area where I, I know you want to move on to other things. Uh, this is okay. just so interesting. Um, we where people have gotten a lot more scared um, because it used to be one of the biggest theories around AI safety was like, well, how could the AI convince us to take it out of the box? You know, we've we've air gapped it. It's safe. It can't affect the world, but it's like it can talk to us. And is it going to be able to like trick us to letting us out? And everyone was like developing really complex systems. Like I said, these are technical problems. And then just like already, like there's there's no sense in which we're holding AIs in the box. And I, you know, unfortunately think that that's going to be true for things like power, managing critical systems. It's just going to be really hard to keep humans from letting the AIs control things like the power grid. Well, it's. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Well, you made me think of something else. The you were mentioning like the paperclip machine earlier. I, I think for those that don't know it, I think what it means is you know you tell an AI to just make as many paperclips as possible, so then it just does absolutely everything within its power to do so, and along the way it basically just overruns the universe, turning everything into paperclips. Is, is that about right? Or 
Uh, Eliezer would get upset at um, giving it the example that way. That's what it turned into in the popular imagination. The original paper clipping example was just the idea that aliens, or sorry, uh, AIs have like really strange goals that they can develop. We have very little control over sort of what they land on and what they want to do. People might have seen this meme online right now of, of Shogoths, like Lovecraftian monsters with like, maybe we, we put a little smiley face mask on them to make them act look nice, but underneath the, just this very bizarre system that we it, don't understand. It is alien I, once you... Yeah. Yeah. And maximizing paperclips was just the example of like a, a silly thing that they land on in goal space of like See, I, some I feel like squiggly. Yeah. I, I think at some point the real world as, as we're, as I'm assuming it is, you know, uh, crashes into it because let's say you put it in charge of a paperclip factory and it's just printing everything, and then you try to turn the software off, and then you realize it rewrote the OS so that it doesn't respond to that now. Then you try to press the power button, but then you find that it's re... Well, actually, at the source... Oh, yeah, then it find it sent in a maintenance order to some repairman who went and re-rigged it so that the power button doesn't work. And then you try to disconnect it from the grid, but then it sent in some order to get, like, emergency... So it starts going through all these Machiavellian kind of manipulation things. I think at some point, like, the, the rest of humanity steps in at, at, once it gets big enough where, like, the, our, like, you know, the FBI or the CIA treats this like it's a terrorist network, basically, is how it's behaving. And there is the argument that, oh, it would just outflank us with every possible thing we could think of. But I would imagine the big government agencies would also have their own counter-terrorist AIs that they would deploy against it, where they would say, no, what you need to do is move this lightning rod at this location, and then, like, two days later, lightning strikes and it short circuits it or something like that. But yeah. I, I, I'm willing to take that risk, I guess, is that the yeah. – the, well, on my chart, you know – you know, the only way I could really see that getting out of control, I mean, maybe I'm underestimating it, but because I heard people talk about how, it, oh, it's smarter, it's smarter, it's smarter. Well, it's like in some ways, I mean, computers right now are smarter than almost every human on earth at math or just anything, you know, it depends on how you define it. But at the same time, a human can choose to go fishing if it wants to, an AI can't. So is that... I'm probably conflating terms again, but I'm not really worried so much about the intelligence of it more than what we're already doing for, and the power we entrust to it. But I, I feel like yeah. at some point the paperclip machine crashes into the real world and the, the people yeah. really worried about that are maybe giving it a little too much credit. But Yeah, for many researchers, what gives them hope is that the agency and the deception and the sort of dangers come before there's too much intelligence. And the AI does something dumb like that. And as you said, it's a near miss and we get our act together. Some people are worried that we'll still be too close to that intelligence explosion. And uh, even if we start getting our act together, you know, the window of opportunity will have passed. And then you also touch on, I think what most people see is, as if, if, if AI goes well, um, how we'll have done it is using some AIs to align and improve other systems and kind of bootstrapping this and utilizing AI because it's so powerful as a tool to make other AI safer. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think the potential benefits outweigh the potential risk is how I look at it. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, I guess, okay, well this is another question on AI that loops back to your, well, I, okay, I, I guess that just to sort of conclude my stance on it, the. I really don't think you have to worry about the ethics of it until we just really have a sign, the ethics of the AI, the treatment of the AI themselves. You know, uh, of course, there's ethical considerations up and down with how we apply it, but uh, mm -hmm. for you know as them as worrying about torturing the AI entities, I really don't think you have to worry about that until you have something kind of showing that signs that something's there rather than just the, this is just a refinement and a refinement, even though it's turned into just a Gordian knot that we're never going to be able to unsol never going to be able mm -hmm. to unravel. Yeah. I'm, but, I'm worried that that might be too late in the sense that 
you know, imagine that the first AGIs are starting to develop, uh, you know, for a second by the assumption that like they, they are going to get super intelligent and they're like growing up in a world where, you know, um, there is this animosity and antipathy and, and, and sort of bad relations and people don't care about AIs. They don't think they could ever even be conscious um, like that. AGI might not be very friendly towards us. And there aren't many examples throughout history. Well, of wouldn't relations- the company running it kind of put their hands on the levers saying you're not friendly enough because this is hurt because our customers want you to be more friendly. So we have to figure out some way to give it a directive to be more friendly. Like, like you said, the chat GPT apologizing when it. You could. And I mean, certainly most attempts to make AI friendly or like that sort of thing. They're like usefulness driven because it makes for a good product if they act friendly. That's where people worry about this Shogoth and this mask and this, you know, are they really friendly? Like if they were super intelligent and wanted to take a negative action in some sense, whether that's like agentic or not, um, it would be in their, it would, it would maximize their goal to act friendly now whether or not they really are friendly under the hood. And I don't think we have good ways to make sure they're friendly in the hood or, or, or friendly, or sorry, friendly under the hood or like friendly in a way that generalizes well to the real world, like in the hood, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, it was giving me an image of a robot walking with like a do rag. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the real uh, world, right. AI I mean, in the hood. Uh, uh, the, oh, what was I gonna say? Okay, okay, well, this is another question. This is the sort of merges the two categories Hoping to get into what I think about what an AI is doing and how I per- how real I perceive it is kind of, it's pretty much irrelevant when it comes to what society is going to do and policy and legislation and things like that. So, do you have any? Did you have any predictions where you where you think things are going with? Uh, like, like let, let's say we do have like strong ethical considerations for AI. Uh, for, for how we treat them, what would that look like to you, I guess? Like, like let's say you have the ear of a mm. uh, room full of senators. So, like, what, would, what would you tell them that we should be aiming for? Yeah, I think right now what we most need is something like a Bill of Rights, uh, not like pretty modest, but a statement similar to what I think we should have. And some places like the UK are starting to get for animal rights. So, I mean, animals are not thought of right now as legal persons in almost any domain. Um, so that this is like a fundamental legal category. It doesn't like people will say it guarantees you certain protections, but it's not like, Hey, you're a person and therefore, you know, somebody can't do this to you. It's you're a person and therefore you can do things like um, a writ of habeas corpus. So if you're imprisoned, you can appeal or someone can appeal on your behalf if you're mentally disabled or a child and aren't able to do that on your own. Um, but sort of that guarantee of like, Hey, if, and when, AIs have sentience uh, or or agency or whatever, but I think sentience is key. Um, they need to be protected from suffering. Uh, they need to have have rights in the way that I think you know animals should for their own protection. Uh, and and I think humans, the way that we've successfully protected more and more groups of humans under the law is that. So I think that's first and foremost. If I truly had the ear, or you know, if I could pass kind of anything. I, I, I think maybe you could do a moratorium. Uh, I think it would be even hard for any single government to enforce that. A moratorium just means a, a complete ban yeah, yeah. Uh, on the production of, of sentience in these systems. Um, and then the other end, so this is true both for the how we treat AIs and for how AIs treat us. One thing we can do is like slow down harms. We can lessen the harms, make them come later, give us more time to prepare for uh, impeding technology. The other is like speed up the positive sides of technology. So you're sort of saying this and you're saying like, there's a lot of really cool applications for AI right now. Um, Like there's a lot of good things that we could support, whether that's AI safety research, whether that's applying AI in beneficial ways, uh, you know, understanding the systems better so they can give, let's say better medical advice. Like right now, the medical advice they give is, is limited in its usefulness because of how poorly we understand the systems. So just funding for research. I mean, if we put anywhere close to as much funding into beneficial AI research as we put into weapons research or, or bio, you know, pharma research or anything like that, that would just completely change the game. So I would push on both of those levers. I, I'm so, well, I'm AI totally in favor risk. of yeah. diverting weapon research to AI research. <laughs> right, right. I, I don't think it's very likely. Yeah. Maybe you should, maybe you should take that angle with depending who you talk to that just, just try to, yeah. What, what was it? We, we had a, Oh, geez, this is in the 80s. We had something gap, like a missile gap or a space. Maybe you need, maybe you need to sell this as the, the, like a means to an end that we need. Oh, we need the funding for this research because 
Otherwise, our defense is going to – all these weapons are useless if we don't have a good enough AI. Mm. And then that, that would get money. That would get – it would be a way to kind of backdoor – so, to something yeah. I would consider more positive, I guess, you know. Yeah. Well, well, that's how we had the internet, DARPA net, you know, with, I mean, not exactly, but that, that was a defense funding, defense funding yeah, project, exactly. you know. Uh, several things, yeah, GPS was another one that I think came from mm. defense industry. I because I, I'm, I'm much less worried about the consequences of hostile AIs than just like straight up weapons missiles you know stuff that can wipe out a city that, so if, if we can get the like framing like, of people but yeah. i also see that as just calcified in our society especially the united states that no there is going to be all this money dumped into defense so if we could kind of divert some mm. of that that's yeah uh, what about, what about where do on this spectrum where do autonomous weapons and, and drones land because like a uh, five years ago um, the kind of future of life institute and the people who are doing like open letters now to pause uh, AI research on like building more and more powerful systems like GPT-4. Uh, in the 2010s, a big part of the discourse was on drones and autonomous weapons because that was like a clear common ground between the short-term concerns and the long-term concerns. I kind of don't, to me it's, you know, if you're being shot, do you really care if it was a soldier that did it or if it's a robot? You, you know, mm. that, that's how I look at it. it it's all the same okay. thing. I mean, I, to me, what would make this like people have asked me about politics before. My politics are fantasy and I know it. But what I would say is what would make a much bigger difference would be not making the arms industry a for profit industry. Like make it so that it's like on need only. Like, like so we decide, OK, OK, we need this much for defense, you know, mm -hmm. th this much for our troops. And like, that's it. We, we don't have an incentive to like dump billions into developing an even faster missile necessarily, or it's much more curtailed. Like, like, yeah, like how many, like, like what's the size of the, maybe the chat knows this, what's the size of our nuclear arsenal right now? Like, I, I think it's thousands of warheads, right? Something like that. So, so I mean, I've heard, I think I've heard some speculation that we could more or less end all life on earth. I mean, maybe oh, separate yeah. stuff on volcanic, vents at the bottom of the sea or something uh with just a hundred or a couple hundred or something so we're way 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 overkill on that so i would look more at the incentives like sure we need defense but uh, i mean this is a whole other conversation but i think it just spirals into just a mania and as long as there's a financial incentive to do that it, that's not going to stop so mm. I, I would see that as like a thousand times more important than whether it's a soldier shooting somebody because we need a conflict because we need to sell arms versus a drone shooting somebody for the same exact same reasons. Hmm. So, uh, uh, well, for the danger level, well, th that's why I put on the, the chart I had, I am totally in favor of not giving nuclear missile launch authorization to any AI, mm -hmm. not even because... Well, well, also because I think this is a very small risk that it would – I think we could probably do make one that would probably be very reliable, but that would also be the problem. If an officer – if a general says fire, the AI is going to obey almost certainly. And we have had incidents during the Cold War where the only reason it is a Mad Max right now is because an officer said no. Like he – we need he needs better confirmation of what he's getting if he's going to launch these missiles. Mm. I think the chat probably knows a few examples of that, but uh, yeah, that, that's. But if it's just you know a drone, I mean, I'd I'd rather we just you know have follow international law. That would probably curtail a whole lot of conflicts, also. Mm. But yeah, I think one one representative issue of, of how hard AI is to control um, and will continue to be unless we have some real innovation um, is how easily it can be a guidebook for for weapons. So you, people might know about jailbreaking of these systems is what they call it, like jailbreaking a phone. Um, like you can get any one of these models and every single one that comes out, you can get to tell you the recipe for napalm and chemical weapons. Yeah. And we just, we have no way of preventing it from doing that. Yeah, well that goes back to what power do we entrust to it? 
I think it's a safe assumption to assume that whatever power you to entrust to AI could potentially be used as a hostile actor. So if, as long as you have like kind of a backup plan for that and contingencies, that's safe enough. But if it's the sort of thing where that leads to millions dead, then ah, no, we probably still need to do that manually. You, you yeah. know, I think that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Whereas like a chat bot, okay, it said, well, you were talking about how it became like was saying things about Nazis or something. Okay, yeah, that's an assumed risk, but the damage is, it's like seeing something offensive spray painted on the mm -hmm. side of a building. I mean, yeah, there could be a few people that get swept up on that, but the the overall damage I see as being pretty low on that comparatively. Mm -hmm. But like, I'm mm -hmm. I'm a big uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of person. Where if it's stuff mm -hmm. that's like this is causing physical harm to like a lot of people, then yeah, that's bad. But if it's something where 99 percent of people are just offended, or some of them think it's funny, and then maybe one percent it hits them too hard, it's like well, it's, there's there's a certain risk of that with life or just interacting with people or looking at things online that, you know, I mean, we, we can try to put up some guardrails, but that's not, it, it's not putting a, it's not get, handing missile control. Over yeah. To, yeah. People, people might've heard one thing about GPT for the latest chat bot. Cause a lot of people have thought about this, you know, is, is speech a, a safe thing? Like if it, all it's doing is chatting, how much harm can be done? Um, it can happen, yeah. but you know, yeah. Um, but with, with GPT-4, one of the safety tests they did, very commendable, a group called the Alignment Research Center uh, evals, their evals team evaluations, um, tried to suggest to the AI to go online um, and perform a task. Uh, these Some of these models have like um, kind of the ability to point and click and type into certain boxes. GP4 happens to not. Oh, I, I, so think, might, kind of I think somebody that. emailed me about this. Is this the one that they got somebody to fill out a CAPTCHA or something? Exactly. So See, yeah, the, it was able to yeah uh, tell them that it had a visual and, impairment. And, and yeah, since, since we brought that up, yeah, so what happened was it gave this as a, objective to be like an evil actor just as an experiment and it managed to kind of hire someone to fill out a CAPTCHA for it because it couldn't do that. See, some people see, I, this is where I think we're kind of maybe anthropomorph. Well, the risk is still real depending on how you use it, but this is where I think some people might be anthropomorphizing, if I'm saying that correctly, a little bit, because what I'm seeing with that is, okay, it's matching patterns and it matched that this is, this is something it needs to have a success state on in order to proceed to the next goal, but it can't do that. However, cap it, it, it has it's matching other patterns that say captures are filled out by people. So it, it and uh, it makes enough connections that it sends that to a person. Whereas other people are seeing like, oh God, it's going to take us over and everything. Or, I mean, it, it can do damage. I'm not denying that, but I it can also cure disease. There was a article I think just I saw just the other day where they're saying that it, AI was better at detecting pancreatic cancer like three years b or before like the average medical professional. I was thinking, yeah, that's going to save lives. So uh, uh, again, I'm seeing more potential benefits than risks. Yeah. A, a if if we're not will... really stupid about it. Yeah. Like, yeah like really of... stupid. Like the missile level <laughs> stupid, you know. I don't, yeah, I think we both share some pessimism there maybe, but um, with with the medical examples, it's interesting because a lot of people are calling for a pause specifically on what we were talking about, like scaling. So like building models, like foundation models, um, general chatbots, like more intelligent than GPT-4, we can take existing systems and solve all sorts of social problems. So most of those uh, medical imaging tools are pretty, I don't wanna say old fashioned, but they're convolutional neural nets. Um, they look at an image, they're largely black box. We don't understand a lot of what's going on inside them, um, but like they're really good at classifying images. And, and that's not particularly dangerous. Like you're not gonna, it's not gonna instrumentally develop a sub goal of, hey, I, I've probably not, I guess I can't rule it out, of I've gotta classify this image to see whether it has pancreatic cancer, therefore I'm gonna go online and hire somebody to do something. Like, no, it's it's constrained to the space of of medical images. And I think, you know, people talk about, we've been in AI winters and now we're in an AI spring. A lot of people are trying to say right now, we need to enjoy the AI summer we're in and not keep rushing ahead towards the fall when we're not ready to handle that powerful of a system. 
Yeah, well, the, you, you just gave me a thought, though. You, you were talking about how AI can solve many social problems. Th this is jumping ahead to something I wasn't even sure if I was even going to get time to talk about. When I look at, like, different systems and ideologies, everything like that, the pattern I – this is kind of like a puzzle for me. The pattern I always see again and again is, is over time things get corrupted. So you, you can mm. we could plan utopia today, and we're just you know are closest to it, but then like a generation or two, some someone's going to undermine it over, for whatever reason, like, and so that by the you know down the line, we're so far off from what it was supposed to be that it's just we're back to square one again with, causing harm, and you just gave me a thought that if we can use AI for manipulation. I, Look, there's lots of social problems we can solve right now. The question is, there's barriers. There's peop usually people, powerful forces or, you know, powerful figures in the way that it's in their interest not to have that solved or their, or their mm -hmm. perceived interest. It, it could either be in their real or perceived interest to not have that solved. So it doesn't get solved. So, however, maybe the AI, if it's more kind of, oh, if it's more free for all or Wild West, maybe we could figure out ways to manipulate like key political figures or something to get something passed that would do. So that yeah, you just made me realize that that just now when you said that because this is why I mean there's all sorts of things I haven't thought of for AI, but well I mean like a more benign example I'm thinking of is like with energy. I've heard thorium molten salt reactors have just like incredible potential for just relatively yeah. clean energy, clean and safe energy, sure. but we're not doing those because it's mostly politics is, is my understanding of it. Well, I mean, if we could clear that out of the way, imagine being able to shut down every coal plant and replace it with a thorium reactor. And I mean, that might even be the end goal, but that would just do tremendous amount of, uh, kind of help for the environment or people's health, that sort of thing, uh, or b bring power to places of the world that it might not have been as viable. That's, so, and I, I think there's just thousands of issues like that. So. Yeah. Yeah, I know you wanted to touch on some more sociological topics too. Um, one project I worked on was on the early days of nuclear power and how it had such different trajectories, in particular in, in France and then in the US and some other countries. Um, and one of the reasons why researchers like me are, are doing interviews like this is because um, in the early stages of technologies, you, you plant the seeds of the conversation for decades to come and how they're framed. And in France, nuclear power in the 1970s was framed as a solution to the oil crisis. It was energy independence, which is this very politically attractive concept. Whereas in the US, in part because of the mistakes of scientists in public discourse, it was very focused on nuclear waste and on nuclear disasters like Three Mile Island, in part because of what they spent their time on instead of arguing, hey, here's the, all the upsides, was like, oh, if there is an accident, it's not going to kill that many people. And that's like not a good way to win the public conversation. So I think we can draw some lessons for the yeah, current well, conversation around AI. To be fair, Chernobyl yeah. was one of the worst things ever to happen in human history and could have been yeah. incredibly worse. Mm. However, that was also in the 80s and we can not have Chernobyl again. So I guess if I was to just take a guess, well, why haven't we resumed like much safer nuclear options? It would probably be just political calcification of, well, There's we set these rules it. then. Mm. So it, it's hard for us to do anything now. So this is what we were stuck with. See. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is, is that your assessment of why we're not? I think that's right. I think it's a calcification both of, of public opinion and, you know, the, the, the vibe and the aura around it in public discourse and of, of law. And, you know, especially in the U.S., just like it's incredibly hard to change the federal status quo. State governments can do a lot more. Um, yeah. But just like especially anything that becomes politicized, that's a huge debate right now within the AI community is like, are we at risk with with this moment that we're in of AI, of it becoming a left-right issue? And I think people really desperately want to avoid that. See, I, I think uh, we're on a tra – yeah, you mentioned you're talking about risk again. I guess we keep coming back to AI. Uh, I see us on a trajectory just – you know, you talk about how it's very hard to get things done at the federal level. I see us on a trajectory where we're locked in for multiple disasters. 
And I don't know if AI is the answer, but I see the AI is putting some Joker cards into the deck where maybe this <laughs> does open up some options. It's a wild card, you know. Maybe this does help us find some solutions to kind of back end around the the stagnation of the system. It's, that, that's not a guarantee at all, but I, I mean, well, I, I gave a list of things on my little chart, but I mean, I, I still, you mentioned the oil crisis. It's not like we solved the oil, we solved the political oil crisis at, at the time, like from the 70s. I, I think, and we were able to kick the can down the road for, uh, I think like with, I, actually there was an article, I think in 2012, where the Pentagon was actually really concerned about like an oil shortage, but that was, but then we unlocked fracking. So that kind of, you know, got us back to levels where we didn't have to worry in terms of energy production, but oil is also just directly feeding into global warming, which, so it's kind of mm -hmm. damned if you do, damned if you don't. So, I mean, I, I just kind of see us like almost tied to this, uh, train car or a bus or something that's like headed towards a cliff in the distance. So if AI means we might be able to steer it in an unknown direction, I think we should go for it is kind of my attitude on it. Yeah. It's, it's not a guarantee at all, but it's, it's, uh, it sends us on a, it maybe sends us on a tra different trajectory where there's more unknown in a potentially positive way. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's like an abstract argument of if we're on a bad trajectory and you've got access to a tool that's just going to add variation. Yeah. So yeah. Like it, it scrambles up, it. Scramb it can I? pull you back up. To me, I think with AI, we like have enough potential control around it. Um, like we can we can focus on the applications you're excited about, pancreatic cancer, et cetera, and not focus on the things that I'm more worried about, like um, scaling up these models to be bigger and bigger. Um, and like asymmetrically introduce AI technology. Well, I'm more excited about that than just- I, I, I guess respectfully disagree. I'm more on the mad scientist's end of the spectrum where <laughs> I just, it's like, no, just anything, try it. You, you know, because I, I see more existential dangers coming at us without AI because, yeah. I mean, yeah, you were talking about crashing the stock market. I mean, with, well, just even something as simple as oil production, I mean, you know, I imagine the food you ate today came from the grocery, you know, and that got there because of oil transporting it. And it was grown because of uh, fossil fuel based fertilizers. We are utterly dependent on fossil fuel. And I think the, the ways we're looking at it, uh, like to try to rotate out of it are just too little too late. And this is heading into yikes territory from my understanding mm. of it. The uh, there's another thought I had, but I think I lost. You go ahead while I try to think of what I was going to say. Oh, I didn't have anything to oh, add there. Okay. It's interesting. Well, well, well that's yeah. just one avenue of things where, you know, if we don't solve this, then in the future we have, like, kind of mass hunger and starvation if we don't kind of intervene. I mean, some people kind of take – I sort of call them techno-optimist, where they kind of take the approach that, you know, technology will find a way – Maybe, but I, I kind of see that as thinking, well, talking about gr graduate, it, it's kind of like waiting until the night before to study for a big test. Maybe you can do an all-nighter and you'll have it uh, aced. I, I have done that for some tests. <laughs> or maybe, nope, this was just too big. You really needed to start two weeks sooner. You know, mm. so it, it's kind of wh – why the, the margins I, – I see the potential danger on the horizon is – pretty significant if we don't if we don't have more breakthroughs or more kind of changes in trajectory and i see ai is potentially rewriting a lot of uh mm -hmm. courses we have wh wh where we think we're going you know yeah maybe maybe the one thing i'd add so i had a op-ed that came out recently in this discourse on needing a manhattan project for ai safety research so uh adding to the amount of research as we were saying it can come from a lot of places in federal budgets or elsewhere um and that might be like more robustly good from some perspectives in the sense that like you can even tell stories for just the existential risk my view eliezer's view etc on why slowing down ai might actually not be a good thing so i'll, I'll give Two examples. One example would be um, 
so Sam Altman, who runs OpenAI, has talked about us having four quadrants for where AI could go. On one axis, you've got a uh, slow takeoff and fast takeoff. So when AI starts to get really powerful, does that happen slowly or quickly? On the other axis, does it happen uh, in a short amount, uh, does it happen soon or far away, uh, short or long timelines? And he thinks the safest quadrant for us to be in and what he's aiming at with OpenAI is uh, slow takeoff and short timelines, making it happen soon. And one of the reasons for this is that if AI is going to arrive, um, it potentially has a lot of tools that it could use if it develops those agency uh, capacities and similar things. So we might want it to sort of come in a time when it's going to happen as slowly as possible and as restricted as possible. And right now, you know, there's there's fewer data centers, there's less compute, there's less software infrastructure than there will ever be in the future, you know, assuming there's no uh, extinction or population collapse or something. Um, so that might make it safer to get AGI sooner. The other argument would be that maybe we have so much excitement and hype and a, such a bubble starting to form that if we just rush as quickly as we can now, it'll pop. So to, to give one one briefly give one other technological example uh, with biofuels in like 2010 to 2013, huge part of American discourse in general, but especially environmentalists, everyone was talking about your fast food oil based car um, that t industry fizzled and didn't have nearly as much progress as people hoped and expected, in part because they had so much hype and so much excitement that the bubble popped. So Kosla and like other people in, in venture capital wanted things to just scale up way quicker than they could. Um, so anyway, there are some potential arguments, even from the existential risk perspective, for not slowing down AI. Yeah, the, the biofuel, see, I, I feel like that's not, well, I mean, I could be wrong, but I, well, again, I, I have a list of things I'm waiting for on AI, and one of them is just things like remove laugh tracks from shows. Or so. Okay. so something that we probably could do now if it was focused in that direction. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but for the, the biofuel, that was something where I think if you were to talk to, I guess what I would call the more serious biologists, environmentalists, that they could realize that the scale we would need this on, I think... I forget what the statistic was, that it would require more farmland than we have just even on Earth to meet because uh, oil or petrol, fossil fuels are incredibly energy dense. Like they're just like manna from heaven for as far as energy. So, you know, that, that's so that's not only competing with food, but it's just not practical. And I actually I can take a cynical view on a lot of things. I think it might have actually been. I kind of feel this way about hydrogen vehicles also, where it might have just been a decoy from the fossil fuel industry to say, yeah, we're mm -hmm. going green. We're going to put some funding in here and into something we know is not going to be able to replace our product. And then this this gets regulators off our back and it changes the narrative to like that we're doing something and people don't need to worry about uh, like not using gas or oil and stuff like, stuff like mm -hmm. that. So this is a way to kind of just you know, get people, get misdirecting people in another direction that they know is a dead end on mm. the scale that it's needed. Uh, well, mm. well, that actually, a microcosm of that actually happened with, well, well, I think it also has similar problems, but I think with General Motors and the electric car is that they, mm. I think they get it as just kind of a throwaway research project just to see its options. And people started liking it too much so they shut it down because they realized this was going to encroach on the more profitable gasoline vehicles on it that mm. they axed. I, I've since learned more that electric cars probably can't scale to the the le the lifestyle the, to the extent that gas powered cars do. But uh, so that that might have been a dead end anyway. But it's. With AI, I've seen so many unknowns, uh, like with, mm -hmm. and the experts are seeing unknowns. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, I, I see so much more potential with that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, oh yeah, well, that was another thing I was thinking of. I mentioned oil production. I think global warming is part of this, but uh, environmental collapse, that, that's why I said, I, I think we're also heading into a, a dystopia, maybe of a different flavor. I, I've made another video before where I've said that uh, minus the actual state-run cannibalism part of it, I actually think the future, the way I see it right now, would most look like Soylent Green. 
So, so you know, with Swing the Green, you know, the big reveal, uh, if I'm spoiling it for people, tough. It came out a long time ago. <laughs> uh, is, is that, you know, they're, the ecosystem has collapsed, so a lot of the food production, some of it's from algae, but the other of it is just from recycled bodies in order to have protein. Well, if I think we're probably not going to go that dark. So I, I'm being an optimist in that sense, but everything else portrayed in that movie, I need to read the book, uh, is just, I feel like, yeah, this feels pretty believable, where you just have massive crowds in cities, like a guy's going to his apartment, and there's just people sleeping and just like in every nook and cranny in the hallway. And the the wealthy now are basically living like how the middle class might today, where they just, you know, access to fresh food is ext- is a very luxury item. The oceans are pretty much dead. Uh, so, see, I kind of see us on that trajectory, you know, without AI. With AI... Let's roll the dice again, <laughs> or keep rolling the dice. And yeah, and going back to what you said earlier with the fast approach and slow approach, I realize what I want is more like what the AI does to learn, where it just tries a, it just tries all these kind of random directions and see what works. Well, that's kind of where I feel like we should be at a uh, societal level. It's just to keep, you know, keep trying something until we have like real progress, you know, because. I feel like the stakes, in my mind, the stakes are high enough from where we're going that it's worth the risk. But yeah. not everything, not everything. You know, I saw some uh, comparisons of AI research, like you said, the Manhattan Project. You know, we could understand if this works with a nuclear bomb, that, that yeah, that, that's incredibly dangerous. That This will kill just anything. You know, in fact, I think with... Uh, that there was concerns that it was going to ignite the atmosphere. That, like, they weren't sure about that. So it's like, even if we're successful, yeah, if we're just 100% successful, then yes, this could, this will kill an incredible amount of people. Whereas AI, it's a lot more fuzzier. You, you know, it's, I'm afraid I don't, well, it sounds like you don't either. Don't subscribe to Yukowski's, uh just certainty that this leads to our extinction. I, I see you. In fact, I, I see extinction via AI is pretty rare. I mean, maybe that's something that, mm. uh, a, a pretty rare chance in my mind. But uh, mm. well, anyway, I was just explaining my take on it. Did was there more stuff you wanted to add, or? Oh, I mean, there's so much there. Oh, okay. Oh, so, yeah, go ahead. No, no, it's, it's super interesting. Um, one thing I was going to say earlier on is I don't know as much about like hydrogen and fuel cells and some of these other technologies, but I know the people within biofuels. It was similar to what we were saying earlier with um, like the green revolution in food technology and overpopulation. Um, like, yes, they're, they didn't know a specific way in which they would make uh, biofuels competitive in land use or something. Uh, you know, maybe like like there are – you can grow a lot of biofuels on non-arable land, like switchgrass could yeah. go on a lot of American land that's just not farmland, like not even row crops. Um, maybe fruit and nut trees, those can go in a lot of places. Um, but that they just expected more technological innovation. Like every industry makes some sort of bet that they will invent new things, even if they can't currently outline a path forward. This is coming up a lot right now with cultured meat, meat made from animal cells instead of whole animals. People are saying like, oh, that'll never be cost competitive because there's just no way to uh, get those ingredients at the right price. You know, it's gonna be too expensive, uh, much more expensive than, you know, just just raising uh, animals on factory farms because especially that's such a like well, efficient- Well, plus we're probably not factoring in the true cost. Of that, of, of, raising, of raising a chicken or something like that. We're environmentally, it's like we're we're in debt beyond what we can even imagine. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah, that that's not yeah. priced into it. Yeah. So anyway, I was just going to say, like, accounting for that uh, uncertain innovation is is important as we touch on a lot of different areas, and then. Um, Maybe on the current moment with with Oppenheimer coming out this summer on the same day as as Barbie and and uh, hopefully this isn't a spoiler too but in the trailer you know Barbie's like sort of breaking out of the simulation so there's a lot oh, okay. similar uh, in those two movies it's gonna be an interesting double feature that day but Oppenheimer you know in one of those trailers they talk about like are you are you sure that this isn't gonna blow up the world and he says like well in theory but but that's not a guarantee it's only theory it's not in practice um, and that's a lot of what has people concerned about AI even if they're not 
and I'm not, as you, you said, Yukowski. I would, I would. Yeah, yeah but even the like, safe version of the nuclear bomb <laughs> blows up a lot. You know? Yeah, so, I, you know? I think there is like an asymmetry there. But I mean, you could make the argument that um, I mean, the reason for the Manhattan Project was not to make a weapon and kill people. It was to, to make a weapon and save people because the the Axis powers were such yeah, an well, existential threat. Th they probably felt like we were on a similar trajectory. Where, geez, how, how many died in World War II? Like fifty million or something. Something Might like be that. more. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that was kind of an ec – in some ways, I feel like what we're facing is on a much bigger scale. However, it's less in your face, whereas it's – when you're bombing cities, yeah, that, it doesn't get more uh, drastic yeah. than that on the individual level. Uh, that is – maybe the last thing I'll say is is that is something really concerning about AI right now. So if you – if anyone listening listened to the congressional hearings on AI, okay. it kept coming up. You know, if we slow this down, if we do this safely, China is going to do it faster and, and beat us and, and that's worse. But the thing is every country, every company reasons that way and that's how you get racist. To the I'm bottom. all for AI yeah. arms race. Yeah. And I <laughs> – yeah, well, that, that's one of the – that's one of the reasons I was glad to talk to you is because I think your reasoning of this is coming from a genuine place. Whereas there is in the, I think once you get on the national level and discussions about this, I saw an article, somebody said to me, it was just last week, the president of Microsoft, like not the CEO, of, uh, I think it was Brad Smith, was saying that like, oh no, we, we need to have licenses for AI. It's like, oh yeah, I, I'm sure... You're just, I'm sure that's exactly why he is worried about it because of safety concerns. And yeah, no, no, Microsoft would never do anything that they thought was unsafe that could make them a lot of money. Whereas if, if they're requiring licenses, that's going to shut out all the, a lot of smaller players of it and it makes it like a less competitive field for it. But I, that's, for the record, yeah, I don't think that's where you're coming from at all. But that's, there are players like that mixed yeah. in the narrative, I think. I think that's something we'll probably agree on as like a current social issue that could be exacerbated with AI is the consolidation of power and just like yeah, inequality. But I, I'm it's, seeing it's, so much already yeah. that <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, I, I'm yeah. almost like, Fair well, enough. what do we have to lose? I mean, I, yeah, well, that, that's why I put on the my examples, old world comparison, the New York Times helping to lie us into the Iraq war. That's pretty big. Yeah. No way. Mm. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm Nick. I just mixed up misinformation with consolidation of power, but th though I guess it kind of overlaps though when you have the a major media organization going along with government instead of being a watchdog towards it, yeah. that is kind of a consolidation. So, yeah, I mean that those I think I think there's a lot of that going on now. With probably a lot of it we don't even know about. Uh, so that, that's yeah. why. If, so fine if we can get. And AI, well, okay, my, my thoughts are kind of drifting. No, no, those are good points. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's see. So we, we sort of bled into sociology questions already. Uh, was there anything more you wanted to add before I moved on to another? No. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, let, let's ask more about, well, yeah, this, this ties in pretty well. Uh, from a sociologist perspective or within your field of knowledge, are there any risks you see coming that you see as more serious than AI, like maybe down the horizon or that, that are like a bigger risk? Yeah, so um, climate change, I think, is a huge risk. Um, the reason why some of us like aren't as focused on climate change is already a ton of people are focused on it. I think I think one thing that might be neglected is tail risks. So there's sort of, you know, best guess estimates for how much warming we'll have, um, which is disastrous and a huge catastrophe. But there's also possibilities that like it's it's far beyond even our, our, our main projections, in which case like geoengineering might be important. So um, people have talked about putting particulates up into the atmosphere. Um, one of the recent wings, actually one of the things I've been most excited about, and this isn't my expertise, um, is oh, what's it called? It's not seasteading, um, but it's like um, flooding an area like around the Dead Sea in the Middle East or even places in the Sahara Desert um, to just create much more water. And this has a mm -hmm. lot of benefits. Fits, but just like building a canal. Yeah, it sounds like terraforming or geoengineering. It's a it's a sort of on yeah. earth terraforming. Um, but these like big drastic measures that might be called for if we are in the worst case scenarios. I mean, you could make the case that they're called for in general, um, but maybe in those scenarios, 
So they climate change is a big one. They were worried the what Salt Lake was gonna evaporate pretty soon. I think I think I was reading they got I mean like this year, but I think they, because it's hit record lows lately. I think I think the Southwest is gonna need a lot of help. The but they found out that uh, I think some of the ice caps melted from like some mountain top peaks that they that, that even though they didn't get enough rain, the it drifted over. So crisis averted for maybe another four years or something. But. Yeah, I was just trying to look up the the name of it. Um, people are talking about flooding the deserts, but I think there yeah, might be a name for I it I find it kind of funny because they actually have discovered, they've actually closed a lot of unsolved mysteries because they found a bunch of bodies at, at the bottom of Salt Lake. Uh, because, I didn't know that. Yeah, because it was maybe some mafiosa types or whatever dumped them there, but now the water levels drop so much that you can find them easily. Uh, wow. Wow. Um, yeah, so that's a big one. Um, I think around biosecurity, so uh, you actually had this in your chart too. Um, natural pandemics can get really bad. Like coronavirus was not at all the worst that it can get. It oh, arguably yeah. isn't even the worst that like people, experts expected. As bad as um, it was, it was not Ebola or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But but yeah, Ebola that, that spread. Yeah, I mean, I mean that Ebola that that's more virulent. That, that would be nightmare. Exactly. You know? um, but but I, especially bioengineering and gain of function research, whether you're you know something's escaping from a lab or somebody's deliberately you know doing doing terrorism to produce a virus. Um, some people question. So so one of the things in existential risk discourse is like there's a big difference between humanity being completely killed off or going into some permanent dystopia that's that's worse than non-existence uh, versus just like a huge catastrophe that like, you know, plummets the population to 10 percent of its current level. But like in 100 years, we're back up to where we are. Like one of those things affects the entire future of the human race. Right. The other maybe changes our society in some fundamental ways, but like we're still around to potentially build a better world one day. Um, and there's some debate around like whether pandemics um, could actually completely decimate the human population. But I think similarly to how we were talking about with AI exacerbating current risks, there's a lot of ways in which like collapse from one of these causes, you know, not even the middle, the median expectation for climate change or of uh, bioengineering could cause other issues. Um, like in AI or each of those could feed into each other. They could feed into social problems, et cetera. But I'd say those are the three like sort of causally biggest factors. I do, and I th you disagree with this, I know. Um, if I had to, to guess, you know, humans are extinct in a hundred years. Why did it happen? I would guess AI is the main cause. To me, it's uh, in one of my videos, I, I said it to me, it's a, a fog of badness. Like I don't know what's yeah. I don't know what's there, but it's not good. <laughs> is what, yeah. currently what I'm seeing. And uh, what's your what's your like if humans were extinct in a hundred years? What's your number one guess for what caused it? Oh, extinct. Okay, if extinct. My number one guess. Geez, I, I don't know. It, it's because some of them are wild cards, like uh, nuclear mutually assured destruction. That that's. That one could happen today. That one may never happen. Um, asteroids is an option, mm, which we need really? a certain level of, that's something AI can help with, detect more asteroids mm. in the sky. You know, th that could potentially do it. I guess uh, environmental collapse to the point where th we just can't even support the, oh, geez, I, I wrote down a statistic, but I lost it. Uh, we, we just can't even support food, but that, that that could take a while. Like I don't know if that would be. And I don't see that as a hundred years trajectory, unless global warming is worse than I think. You know, because I've heard there's some theory we could go. I think it's called a hot house Earth, where we where we basically turn into Venus. In which case, yeah, that's all done. But my understanding is that's kind of remote, even like on a worst case projections, like even with feedback loops. But that could still just decimate. Food, because you, you can have, again, feedback loops or cause cycles where, yes, let's say we still can produce enough food to feed like 5% of the current population, but because everything's such chaos, that food doesn't make it to where it needs to be, and that leads to even more death and that sort of thing. Yeah. The, and for, like, I guess, for, for pollution, I'm not sure. Like, I think that's one where... Mm. That might not knock us out as far as extinction, but it, it could kind of 
permanently lower lifespans, that sort of thing. Mm. Where, uh, because w- if, if you haven't heard of it, look up Forever Chemicals. Uh, mm. That we're, We've basically been putting out toxins. I think it started, it might have started with DuPont, where it's like they never break down. And it, there's estimates that there's trace amounts in basically every living thing on Earth now. Now, in high concentrations, those cause all kinds of diseases and cancers. And I think they determine, like, no level is considered, like, safe. Like, this is always just bad. Mm. But at the same time, you know, natural selection doesn't care about your lifespan. It, it cares about if your progeny make it. <laughs> so mm. uh, that one may not be as much of an extinction risk. But, yeah, oh, that, that was, okay, the statistic I was thinking of, I could be getting the numbers wrong, but it was def- at least this high. Like 85% of the oxygen produced on Earth is like from like the ocean biosphere. So if mm. we manage to get toxins high enough that we actually kill off the oceans, I don't know where it goes from that. Because, yeah, we might have a kind of dystopian domed habitats kind of thing where we can kind of keep mm. on plodding along, but... But, but there's other things that can kind of compound that because on the list I put on my chart, uh, it's what's also called a Carrington event or a coronal mass ejection where the idea is it's essentially a super flare from the sun. Yeah, yeah. Where we This has happened before where it could basically knock out almost all electronics on Earth or just completely mm. fry them. And this this was documented in – the eight, this happened I think in 1859 – where there were reports where telegraphs were just staying on, <laughs> like on their own. And, but the thing is, disrupting all electronics and electrical devices in 1859 wasn't that big a deal <laughs> then, whereas mm. that would be cataclysmic today. And if we progress farther down the line without having kind of a, a f- strengthened electronics that could kind of withstand that erosion, well, then maybe the electronics we depend on to make our air cleaner or to filter our water or something like that, if those get knocked out as far as like a combo punch, maybe that leads to extinction. Mm. So, You might be interested in a book by a philosopher, Toby Ord, called The Precipice. And this is about how humanity is currently at this precipice of potentially extinction, potentially, you know, utopian future out in the stars. Uh, And I'm reminded of it in particular because one of the goals of that book is to, he had like a big research team that was working on it. So it ended up being pretty thorough is to come up with, with, you know, so necessarily subjective quantitative estimates for a bunch of different risks. And I know he has uh, asteroids, uh, solar flares, and then of course AI and climate change and the other things we talked about, but he tries to come up with his own, you know, quantitative ranking. of Yeah. And and some of those are really preventable if we do have a certain level of technological yeah, advancement. Yeah. Asteroids is a perfect example because there's no reason, if, if if we're not idiots, there's no reason an asteroid has to wipe out anything on Earth if we get good enough with it because we could send a missile out there, you know, three years in advance and nudge it off course so that we're good. But that depends on spot, that depends on have us being able to spot it. And if things are back to the middle ages, then we're not spotting it ahead of time, you know, or mm-hmm. having the, the capacity to deflect it, that sort of mm-hmm. thing. Oh, I have thought I was, ah, shoot, I had a good thought, but I lost it. So. Uh, yeah, that, shoot, it, it was a good thought, but that's okay. But, uh, let's see, what else did I have for the questions? So, yeah, well, I, I guess I got confused. Did you answer that as far as what you think are the highest ones, or were you just kind of not sure and asking me? Or I, uh, AI is the only one. So one thing we talked about over email is I've got a page on my website that has a list of probabilities for a bunch of questions. And I'm a big believer the, the other book I'd really recommend is Super Forecasting. Um, so I think we have better ability than we think to come up with quantitative forecasts and, and iterate and practice and, and get better at our expectations about the world rather than, you know, the, just these vague guesses that we, we, we intuitively focus on. Uh, and you know, go AI ahead. is go the ahead. only one, AI is the only one I think that I like have, you know, uh, an extinction risk explicitly on there. That, that also got me thinking, uh, probably not extinction risk, but as I understand, well, going back to the fossil fuel again, 
There's also risks that are just enormously bad, even if they're not extinction risks. And I, I kind of see fossil fuels a little bit like that because my understanding is from biologists I've seen talk about it, the carrying capacity of the earth, like with our technology level, without fossil fuels is about one to two billion. So that's how many people we can feed Mm -hmm. Without fossil fuels, but we're still using technology, you know, solar. Because even things like solar panels still requires a whole lot of fossil fuels just to produce. And the infrastructure, our, in fact, if you look at like the, our technological growth, you know, from 1850 to now, it's just, it looks like an exponential curve with, what, with everything we've accomplished, with technology, population, sustainability. But... There's a theory that a whole lot of that is because of the use of oil, because it just, it's utterly transformed our society because it's so energy rich that we can have all these uses for it. Mm. And I think we maybe, not in the same way, I think maybe over time we could adapt to something that's much more sustainable. But in my eyes, it's like we're barely trying. It, it feels like limp-wristed effort mm. for what we're doing with it. Whereas, yeah. Uh, uh, yo, yo, did you want to add something or? Oh, I was just gonna. Well, it's a bit of a tangent, but um, no, I, as a kid, I was I was I was very weird, and um, I'm sure I didn't play as many video games as you, but I was very into to fantasy books and you know imagining myself in magical worlds. I thought I was an alien for several years. I like couldn't really understand my own mind. I'm very strange. Like I sleep four hours a night and this sort of thing. I wanted to ask um, you about that, but we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> oh sure. Um, but uh, with oil and fossil fuels it has a lot of similarities to like the magic systems in many fantasy worlds like they where they have this unta this tapped untapped resource like like mana or you know some magical power like you know air bending or something um and it's really unique and it, it did fuel a lot of like the sort of steampunk world that we we live in arguably or at least like we're built building at that point same thing with like silicon and like the fact that we can make these computer chips and stuff like it's easy to underappreciate the the magic that we have in the world today and also when we talk about you know population collapse and like what, what it would be like to rebuild and would we be a better society or worse society um or like what would the challenges be one of the big challenges is that like they might not have that fossil fuel resource to build up they'll have another resource maybe which is like our technology you know a bunch of blueprints for different things um but it's really hard to guess what that world will be like barring some incredible disaster I don't see us falling much back beyond like the Middle Ages to maybe uh, you know pre-industrial revolution era. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, that doesn't mean billions can't die on the way. And see, yeah, like when you were talking earlier about extinction versus dystopia, where a massive number of people die off. I figure. I feel like maybe we should aim higher <laughs> than either of those, you know? Yeah. I, I think some aspects of dystopia are just kind of here to stay, but that doesn't mean we can't aim the aim as high as we can within that framework, you know? We could outgrow them. A lot of a lot of those might exist for, you know. I know I, you know, again focus a lot on factory farming and how terrible that is. And one argument is like we don't want animals to suffer. Nobody eats meat because it comes from factory farms. Um, but because like we're selfish and like we we just like want to be happy, even if it has that cost. But we, we don't have to have that cost in the future because we can produce those goods without that extra cost once we have the technology. See, see I think the selfishness is even like overplayed sometimes in you know, narratives. Like I think I think, I think most people just kind of go with the flow, you know? Yeah. So it, 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 I think, and they're not, most people just aren't monsters or just completely selfish, grabbing things, but the, but whatever systems are in place to steer people different directions, that's where the majority of people end up going. So, uh, but I, I, at the same time, the people who tend to most want power often are very selfish or not having uh, mm -hmm. the needs of others really into consideration because your average person probably doesn't want to be like king or, or something like that because yeah. they probably would rather, you know, read fantasy books or play games or go fishing or, or something like that. Well, well okay, I guess f fish, you, you don't want to hear that they want to go fishing, but <laughs> you, you get the idea. Go for a hike or, or something. Um, 
Yeah, I think that it's a really important thing to appreciate about people when it comes to behavior change, whether that's for climate change, you know, environmental behavior or animal welfare or, or even things related to AI, um, is that people go with the flow. And a lot of people now are familiar with nudges, this idea of like if you take organ donation and instead of making people have to opt into it, you make them have to opt out to it. Like that, that's not actually changing people's like what they're forced to do. They, they still have both options. But because so many people just go with the default, you get vastly more organ donors in the population and save many lives. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it can vary because when you said nudges, my first, like again, I said I can be cynical. My first thought was of some top politicians talking about like incrementalism when I, I've always, I've almost always seen that as meaning let's put a bandaid on a gaping, on a gushing wound mm. that isn't really, that isn't really addressing the problem. Whereas that is a legitimate argument that you nudge thing in the right trajectory. Well, like we were talking about with asteroids, that's a nudge, you know, <laughs> and that's literally uh, uh, that changes the whole trajectory in a massive way, but that's almost never how I see it in politics. It tends to be much more cynical. Like, let's pretend we're doing something that's going to lead us to a great outcome over time, but it, it's not. Uh, so, yeah. uh, let's see. Uh, I had some more questions. Just checking my notes quick. Yeah, we covered several other things already. Well, okay, I guess, yeah, th this is a real broad one, but, uh, well, no, it's not that broad. Well, okay, I guess there's two questions. I guess, well, the first one, do you have any predict, well, okay, this would be the same question. Do you have any predictions as a sociologist of, like, trends you're obviously seeing that you think you can make a, probable guess about where we might be going in, as far as society, either either with AI or other factors that you've seen or like like what 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 could we maybe expect for the future? Like that that with your limited crystal ball based on your knowledge base and looking at trends and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's a big question. Kind of I can give different answers. By yeah, you can you can hone in on different things. That's fine. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, one of the places my mind goes to is people talk about. You mentioned earlier communicators and tablets on Star Trek. Yeah. Um, and people talk. Uh, so I mean, a lot of people make this claim that sort of Star Trek made those things happen. I don't think you did. But like it's an interesting question. Like counterfactually, would they have happened? Um, or the other thing this comes up with is like the Jetsons, as we were talking about with robots, but also like flying cars and transporters and things like that. I think they my helped. guess. Yeah, I think they helped, they helped indirectly. Yeah. yeah. I think they had, yeah they inspired a lot because they would have given that drive to somebody who did do work that led to it. You know. Yeah, or for like a better like nerd culture and like geek culture like developed in the late 1900s and people got into computers in part like that was a huge Jules part. Jules Verne's, I mean. <laughs> yeah, even back then. Um, so I think that um, I I intuitively, as a person living in the 2000s, born in the late 1900s, uh, I can say that. I think those were sort of obvious in hindsight and like we could have predicted those. So to me, like a communicator makes a lot of sense. A cell phone makes a lot of sense. Like, yeah, all these devices that it's useful to have on the go, uh, a calculator, your phone, uh, writing utensil, et cetera. Yeah, you should put all those on one device and it should fit in your pocket. Like it doesn't make sense to carry them all around, um, et cetera. And, you know, things like Moore's Law is making things smaller makes it practical. And like, yeah, flying cars don't make sense. It's just like a huge amount of resources. Like maybe if you had really dense roads, but then you should just like build roads on top of each other or something. Like the, the act of, you know, taking your car to the grocery store and having it fly a few feet off the ground um, like it doesn't seem too practical transporters that's like the laws of but, but it's also somewhat. easy to imagine too like the, the, just not to bring up ai again but like that's kind of where i see the the ai emerging as a being is kind of being like the flying car where you know it, it's it's easy to see that as a progression psychologically i think okay sorry i didn't mean to cut yeah. yeah no that's a good point yeah. um so then like what, what i have to ask because like I'm a big believer in, you know, the the rubber hits the road when it comes to empirical predictions about the future. So, for example, like um, my fellow social scientists, psychologists, uh, economists, sociologists, um, a lot of people come up with these grand theories, but they don't like make concrete predictions about the future. And I think like that's if we have knowledge about the world, if we're doing our jobs, we should be able to better predict the future. And like that's what it means yeah, to, to understand the sure. world. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and I can't back test on those things. Uh, like I, my, my, my statement about like the present is predictable from the past is like meaningless. Like it's, you shouldn't take me seriously except in like the abstract. So then I, I think like, what could we predict today about the future? Um, and I think there are some things that like, we're kind of clearly headed in that direction. I don't know how fast change is going to be, but like virtual reality and, and augmented reality and these things like seem like sort of an obvious win and they're like not that technologically infeasible. Like, so Google glass, for example, would be something that came a bit before its time. This is like, you know, augmented reality. Uh, they were kind of heavy glasses. Oh, yeah. They weren't very stylish. Oh yeah. 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 Um, Google I like that you wear out in public too. Um, like it came before its time. But like things are getting smaller, that's getting more doable. I do think we're on our way to that. I think a lot of like wearable technology and not just wearable, but starting to be integrated with us. Um, I have a friend, Pedro Lopez, a computer science professor here, who's doing things like um, you can have virtual reality games where instead of having to produce real heat or cool, you just have something hooked up to their nose. So they get like a tiny imperceptible amount of capsaicin, uh, like what's in peppers uh, or, oh, or yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's all. No, no, I think that's yeah, right. Or, They're similar, yeah. Yeah, yeah, or or a minty uh, smell. And people don't notice this. It's not like you, you get hungry and you're like, oh, there are peppers around. Um, it feels hot and, and you, you feel that you're close to a fire when you're in the moment. Um, so I think some of these things that are just like on that same trajectory of consumer technology, um, I think is like an interesting prediction that we actually can reason about with more confidence than these you know big things about AI. Except, you know, in the abstract, when it comes to things like the laws of physics, um, like I don't think teleporters are going to be invented. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I'm not betting on teleporters. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 you bring up a good point that we should be able to predict more things. That's why I, I was bringing up stuff like oil production and collapsing the environment, because I see so many indicators that this almost seems like a sure thing because we're utterly dependent on oil now. There's not an obvious replacement for it. We're not making a big effort towards switching off it. Yeah, like I, I've heard that we use about 75 to, 75 to 80% of our energy is from fossil fuels. And that's about the same as it was 50 years ago. So mm -hmm. it, it's like, th this is, now that doesn't mean we can't change, but it, it, it certainly suggests we're not going to unless we're forced somehow. Yeah. Uh, and there is finite fossil fuels. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, we can do stuff like switchgrass, but then there's the scaling and everything. And, yeah. and same for environmental collapse. It's like we're seeing, we're losing more of, oh, well, I sent you that article in the email about, yeah, that, that blew my mind from like 1970. We've lost about 70% quantity wise of wildlife. That yeah. to me that like you know the analogy of canary in the coal mine to me that says yeah. the canary's dead <laughs> you know we uh, like we should like yeah maybe the workers haven't fallen over yet but you know yeah. so to me that says yikes you know with what and then as you have extinctions that's very likely something we don't get back you know so mm. and it, it's like the sooner we kind of reverse course on that the better. But yeah, well, one of one of my like most developed predictions, what well, my previous book was about, um, which is related to that is is the end of animal farming and factory farming. And I do think we're on our way to having, you know, impossible burgers and beyond burgers, but also meat made from animal cells. And when I make the case for like why that's going to happen, uh, a lot of the book is about like how it's going to happen and the details of how technological change happens. But a big reason why it's going to happen is because I think there's going to be just an urgency and i think there's gonna Me be such a lot of resources I mean, exactly like we're gonna have yeah to. i mean the hand hands are gonna be forced uh, essentially on that so yeah exactly so I, I kind of sometimes walk people through a timeline and say like right now we're doing a lot of r d where we're creating the first prototypes of products figuring out how to do it um i think over the next few decades as climate change accelerates like that's when things are going to really speed up and there's gonna be desperation and like that's going to fuel not just the development of better and better products but their mass production and because of economies of scale that's when you'll get really large change and the whole food economy will shift yeah actually something that it might not even have to be like an actual physical, well, directly disaster, but you, you mentioned like with climate change heating up, it could also be an economic crash that, you know, because we're just, we're extended just on a massive level. And my understanding is we're doing things a little recklessly with 
with uh, how we how the economy is managed. Like like the dollar is the world reserve currency, but even without that, a whole lot of other dependent other currencies are priced against it, and we have global trade all over the place. So, like what I think the national debt is on like thirty one trillion, and we're my understanding is we can't pay that off except unless we just keep inflating more and more. Well, if we keep inflating more and more, that takes us to someplace probably not helpful. So I, so even if even if there's not physical reasons we can't just keep going along, if you know, if dollars are worth as much as pesos, so you you, you can't afford to pay your rent or you can't afford to buy groceries and then the supply chain chain gets cut off because they're not getting, it's not worth it for them to have the payments anymore, then that's just, that can be chaos for a while. So, and that could spur all kinds of changes. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think every possible future here is, is weird. I think I'm, you know, (laughs) more pessimistic than you on a, on AI. Um, you're maybe more pessimistic than me on other things, but I do think like big changes are coming. And I, I, I very briefly mentioned this earlier, but there's this end of history fallacy. And when people imagine the future, um, they imagine it much like ours, but just like with with some new fashion trends or something. Yeah, no, I'm not in that camp like, at all. <laughs> it's going to be, be very be different. Thr- I, I'll, I'll be thrilled if it's not like, well, okay, the thing, the one thing I think Soylent Green kind of missed the the mark on was technology, was that it, it, there were, it wasn't that much better, whereas oh, yeah. I, I think it's going to be, I, I see it more like an amplification of, a lot of good and bad things, but maybe more yeah. bad than good in my eyes, but I could be wrong. And AI is the unknown. Like, yeah, let's turn up the volume on that is how I feel about it. Yeah, uh, there's a uh, law, it's called Amara's law um, in forecasting, which is that people tend to underestimate change um, in the long run. Um, but overestimate change in the short run. So I'm actually like this on AI. Um, I think there's you know an incredibly cool and exciting element to the current moment we're in with AI. But there's so many people saying it's just like you know start your Chat GPT business today and it's going to take over. Well, everything. That, that's going to be with any new technology. In fact, yeah, it was kind of it was kind of eye opening to me. Well, well there was two technologies that kind of made me think, wow, these people just like they they're just they don't know what's going on at all. Some of the people, like like the two ones that may, maybe will upset some of, some people watching this, but the two big ones for me was one for NFTs, where I could understand how cryptocurrency could have some utility, but NFTs just seemed redundant on every single level to to me. Mm. It, like it just wasn't. If you have cryptocurrency, then. Well, but the other one was uh, the metaverse from Facebook. And I say this as someone who is very familiar with a lot of different types of games. And it's like, well, no, we've had something like this before. There, there's Second Life. There was VR chat. Uh, the, there, there was some others. And uh, and those are niche audiences. And that was supposed to be like exclusively a VR thing. And I, as someone who's a big fan of VR, I realize that's also a niche uh, crowd that, you know, maybe it grows more, maybe it just kind of maintains its current interest. I don't know, but man, the, you're trying to combine a niche, a niche and a niche together. And, uh, it's like the way you do like, any sort of like big project product that you're like trying to change the landscape on is you, you need, uh, you need bait, you need a lure, you need some reason that people really want to try this. Like, mm-hmm. and it seems like they were kind of front loading. Look, you can sell stuff to people online. And it's like, well, I imagine if you want a casual audience, you know, you know we were talking about movies, Oppenheimer, or they want to go there for a fun, for an interesting story, you know, or kind of be wowed by the experience. So, or just like Barbie, they're, they're not thinking about the cost of the ticket as much. Like, you don't put that first that you can look, you, you can buy something for a higher price in the theater than you can hear. Like, that's not why people go to movies, you know? Yeah, yeah. I agree with you on Metaverse. Uh, yeah. Not, so, yeah and, and so what I saw... Not the, oh, not sorry, the old go ahead. cool one. Uh, just the science fiction, you know, Metaverse is an old term from science fiction. Oh, yeah. That well, was, well, I've read that Snow was Crash, cool. you know. Yeah, yeah. The, the, but, yeah, it, it's... Well, when I saw these financial gurus talking about that, like, this is a 
big, I'm thinking, wow, they must do this with, with everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some people could see, I mean, not everyone in finance is like that, but there were more voices than there should have been, in my opinion. This is a fascinating internet culture thing, the way people have pivoted from metaverse to blockchain and now to AI. And it's like the same voices, well, you know. Well, AI, I am seeing the potential there. Like, at least AI... I mean, they may still not know what they're talking about, like some of the speculators on this, but like I, I can see a lot of just immediate benefits. I can see a lot of probable benefits, and I can also recognize there's all kinds of stuff I haven't even thought of that is going to emerge yeah. from this. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad they're stuck on AI then, but well, my, or you're <laughs> maybe not, but. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, well, so any more. I guess general trends and predictions that you foresee that you can think of off the top of your head. Not or? any particular ones, but I, I would encourage people. You know, there's a website Metaculous where a lot of people log predictions about things, and and you can put in numbers, and it's a good way to iterate and get better. Do, at, do at some users develop a reputation from that? So if this person gets like seven predictions right out of ten, that they rise up with points or something like that. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a definitely leaderboards and stuff like that. Um, yeah. uh, it's part of the good, or it's related to the Good Judgment Project. So Philip Tetlock, who's uh, wrote that book, Super Forecasting, and is just a brilliant person, um, has talked about what makes for really good quantitative forecasts about the future. Well, so one of the things, for example, is being quantitative. Like so many people hesitate, especially like it's really unnatural for me to say like I'm. 94.23% likely that something happens, but like the, the more detail we have, the like easier it is to know when you're wrong and to iterate and improve. Um, so a lot of good practices that have led to the creation of like super forecasters and forecasting tournaments where people do really well. A lot of this was based on this finding that like in the initial research Philip Tetlock did, um, they found that these like experts who are forecasting or people in the intelligence community in the US <laughs> uh, were as good famously as, you know, monkeys throwing darts at a dartboard and uh, just, just as good a chance. They probably chance. have it's access to a lot of information. Uh, yeah, so they've been able to get good, but it's been these people who like know the best epistemic practices who have who have really excelled, and I think that's really exciting. Um, there's manifold, which is also like a more casual uh, environment for that manifold markets. Um, so I'm I'm excited about forecasting in general. Yeah, I wish yeah, I had more no, time it's... to do it. Uh, there's some people who are like professional forecasters and you wow. know like like for example the russo ukrainian war like there's a bunch of people trying to debate you know uh, predict every little development and and they iterate and get really good at it how much do these people actually get into mass media though i feel like i feel like oh, they're like really, on, listen i, to I feel like there's, there's you could almost fail upwards of forecasting with the more mainstream the media outlet is. oh yeah yeah no, the, the hope there is that there's this sort of pipeline developing with the intelligence community in particular in the U.S., um, but of institutions and nonprofits and some people in government. So, for example, um, the the leader of IARPA, um, some people in the intelligence community, that's, that's Jason Matheny, uh, Jason Gavrick Matheny, who's been around for a long time and has worked on issues like AI and food technology, um, are big supporters of this. And they've like hosted these tournaments and stuff like that. So it's more of a behind the scenes. They inform like um, people in power. Um, I don't know if they're ever going to get on, you know, uh, cable news <laughs> next to uh, the okay. yeah. talking head. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. So here's where you go if you really if you want to see better results. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I go there and if I like have a question I'm curious about or like I don't know if Elon Musk is going to land on Mars, I'll go there and they'll usually have a probability of like uh, – and then it's, it's imperfect, but they're getting better over time and it's like better than intuition. And, oh, and, and the media. chat reminded me of something that I was, I was being asked and I forgot here. Oh, are you are you familiar with the MIT study? I think it was called Limits to Growth that was done back in the 70s and they recently – and what it is, they, they tried, they used, it was actually one of the first computer assisted, computer model assisted studies uh, where they tried to predict where we were heading. And they looked at all kinds of things. It was like they looked at population, arable land, you know, sea life, metals we're using, pollution, like all, just try to factor in all these different variables as they could. And they made, I think, it was a series of, I, I think they, came up with like 10 different models like of, okay, well, if things are kind of worse, we, we go this way, or if we're kind of ahead of the curve, we might do this. And they, they analyzed it, they reanalyzed it recently, probably have a few times, but I think it was like the 50th anniversary not long ago. 
And what they found was like one of the models, which, which they call business as usual, which was we're not changing the trajectory you're on the whole lot, you know, was very, it was eerily accurate for what, and what this, the conclusion from this was that civilization as we know it basically starts falling apart around 2040. Are mm -hmm. you, have you heard of this? I didn't hear the 2040 number, but I, oh, okay. I've heard of limits. Yeah. I think limits to growth is the initial study. I'll put a link in, I see, I don't know if I have it handy. I'll put a link in the chat on YouTube when, the, when this goes up. But th there was a summary somebody had that was pretty good of it. But there was another book that looked that went and looked at it and tried to compare it went much more into depth in it. I'll try and get the I name see. of that. I know there's a 1967 book called The Year 2000 uh, that people point to as an example of like good evidence-based predictions. I think it was for computer related predictions. I think it was 80% correct. Like somebody went through and tried oh, to wow. tally all of them the way they do for like Nostradamus or something, but you know, this yeah, is yeah. real. <laughs> well, that's also one of the reasons I'm, uh, oh yeah. Okay. Here's, well, I, I don't want to risk giving it to you on Skype and screw up the, <laughs> the videos. <laughs> I'll, okay. I'll, I'll just post it in the, sure. the chat here. <laughs> that, that's the summary of what the analysis of the, limits to growth was the, yeah so th this is also why i feel like well if these a lot of smart people at mit but i could see them not not accounting for ai because that's a big change so yeah. i that, that's why i'm, I'm kind of hoping that buys us more time yeah but, there's there's like in economics there's something called the lucas critique so uh, this economist who said that we can't predict the economy um, because as soon as you come up with measures for it, especially if like the Federal Reserve and other people pick it up, uh, like that the game effect, has, yeah. yeah, the game has changed because you came up with those measures and you're influencing things, et cetera. Um, I'm a bit more optimistic than that. People also debate this. So um, I'm at the University of Chicago and here we have uh, at the business school, um, the efficient markets hypothesis was developed. So this idea that, you know, st individual stocks are unpredictable because the market it has efficiently priced them. So for every upside, you know, there's a downside pulling them down and they're at the price that they should be. You can still do things like bet on the whole market, but it's basically an argument against trying to predict little trends or whatever, as long as you're not like an institution, like a big investigator, an investor who's working on this full time and has expertise in usually some really narrow domain. But I think there are decent arguments for some of these things as to why it's like really hard to predict them. I don't think that applies to like society as a whole and, and the, most of the things we've talked about. Um, but there are interesting ways to think of like, in what ways are, are, are factors priced in? And people have tried to argue this around AI and you know, how likely is it that we see an explosion of super intelligence and this like huge economic growth, whether that's followed by catastrophe or, or not. Um, and they've said like, well, you know, Nvidia went up like 25% the other day and, and that's evidence that the market think efficiently thinks that AI really is gonna become very big. And then other people will say, well, it hasn't taken off as much as, you know, people expected it to. Yeah. You, uh, in one of your emails, you talked about like you had some techno economic background or some forecast uh, or technology. Do you think AMD is going to step in at some point? I feel like they might be missing the train. Oh, I'm like not an expert on this. I know they okay. recently tried to pitch uh, their stuff. I, I work with I, I don't do much uh, building of these models myself. I, oh, I do I a little I bit of it. Dog, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, they heard something in the hallway. Or, or some, I'm, I'm guessing a dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they run on the floor, so it's it's, it's fine. Little... That's no problem. So um, they they tried to get in the game because you know everyone uses Nvidia for machine learning stuff, and I've heard that like people are just complaining about it. It's really hard to work with. So it's an arms race. I mean, the the big question people have, and I don't have any good predictions on this, but is around Taiwan. It's just incredibly unique to have this whole industry that AI is essentially built on be concentrated on this tiny island. And that's just so, so well, dangerous. Well, I, you know. Aren't they building some fabs in the United States? I think I heard. They've, they've been for a long time. Um, it's really hard. So yeah, I you mean, can't like, just snap these, your fingers over that. Yeah, yeah. The, these fabs, like, you know, you account for the, the location of the moon, like the cycles of the oh, moon. Oh, wow. The, the, the cosmic difference. radiation, these, probably, yeah. Yeah, that too, maybe. But yeah, just like the fine difference in gravity can affect the, the process wow. of building this. Yeah, yeah I, I know the stats on the clean rooms are it's just, it's unreal that we're able to do that. Yeah, like the smallest particle of dust can like, 
the well, this you may not know this either. Do, do you think we're go- the way I'm seeing it going? I almost want them to decouple the a- AI from GPUs and just to have stand-in cards. Do you think we might be heading in that direction at all, or like for the consumer level, or so, so yeah, instead of maybe. just having a, oh, sorry, you give me the consumer level is weird. So I mean. For example, people used to be really focused on fine-tuning models. Uh, there was this idea that you would take GPT-2 and, and you know, in, in academia, for example, there's something called, well, I talked to, I mentioned BERT earlier as a model. There's CYBERT, which is um, trained to, to specifically work on scientific text. So a bunch of these papers, and it's like more focused on that. And if you ask it questions, it'll give you a more scientific answer. Meta actually tried to like release a model. It, it kind of went in the memory hole. Um, that was more scientific focused, and it was just so bad. And like since it was focused on science, it was so apparent that they actually like closed it down very quickly. Um, but now the focus instead is on prompting. So the idea is these models are so powerful already, and they already have so much text in them that instead of needing your own GPU or or, or TPU or whatever to fine tune the model. Uh, you can just prompt chat GPT or something. This raises these oh, consolidation so of power hmm. issues. But yeah, that might, yeah, that's the big yeah. sort of side crusade of mine is to stop. This is, this is more like a hobbyist thing, but the, in gaming especially, there's this trend of putting essential files server side that don't have to be server side. Then the company runs it for a while. Then they shut it down. Now you, now you have a brick copy of the game that you can't run again so yeah that you're right that so they might move away from from a consumer having like an expansion card just for ai and more towards just send it all to the cloud so that you have no control over it yeah that's possible these models are also huge you know Mm. um palm 2 which is kind of the most recent model um at google is 340 billion parameters uh, which is gigantic um that's about the number of synapses in a rat brain um, so again, like there's yeah. a lot to a synapse. It might be a lot more complicated, but like that's getting huge and and pretty infeasible for yeah, consumer hardware. Yeah, it just might not even be doable. Ah man, uh, well that that's actually one of the things I'm very that, that's the top of my list for a, for fun stuff for AI. I made a I made a video called Dream so- Software of My Dreams, where it'll basically look at a 3D scene and try its best to create a mock-up of it on the fly and have and stitch it together. So it would come up with a model that, like say you have a pillar, it, it, it's similar to photogrammetry, except it would kind of stitch it all together and apply the textures. And I feel like the more AI gets, the better AI gets, the more we're gonna be able to look at just a video of a game and recreate that world. And then you can have the AI try to implement like some NPC type behavior or try to emulate some of the mechanics it thinks it's seeing. So, so it would be a sloppy copy, but you might, it would be more than bricking the game and killing it. So that's one of yeah. the things. There, there has been a lot of research on this um, for multiple reasons, um, but on distilling these models and making them smaller. Um, I mentioned scaling laws, and there was a paper that came out with a model called Chinchilla, which you don't really hear about much, but um, there were other models like Gopher and stuff, they have funny names, uh, that basically showed a different scaling law, so a different kind of line for how much performance increases that showed that instead of uh, having bigger and bigger models, you should have smaller models, but train them for a really long time. So like do multiple passes through the data, huge, huge amounts of data. um, And that would build an overall higher performing model. And a lot of people, you know, GPT-4, we have very little idea of how it works. We can guess, but from the outside, like there's very little public information. Um, We can talk about the reasons for that. Um, But people think it's probably on chinchilla laws. So it's probably a smaller model. This is still huge and and hard for consumer hardware, but at some point I think they're gonna have an interest in making them smaller so it's cheaper to run so that it doesn't cost as uh, open AI as much for you to use ChatGPT. They make more money. Like there are a lot of reasons to have small models, but you kind of have to start with the big one and then learn from that and distill it. So one of one of the approaches here is just called pruning. So you just uh, keep running the model and take away certain nodes in the network and see what retains the performance. And just presumably there are a lot of like extraneous nodes that you can get rid of with a minimal drop in performance. I think optimization. I think we're going to see optimization never cease to be relevant as time goes on. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because it sounds similar to that. That you're getting the most yeah, yeah. that are most useful, most bang for yeah. your buck, I guess, or bite. Yeah. 
Well, I think that's all I have for big questions. I had a few kind of lighter ones if you have time sure. for it. This kind of, of went on a little longer, but this, this has been a great conversation so far. Uh, okay, well, yeah, I guess the big one I have to bring up. I have a few questions on this, but let's see what you say. Uh, tell us more about your sleeping four hours a night. I want to <laughs> – how you got into it, what, what the, what's the plan or the routine or – Sure. Um, So when I was 19, I was doing an internship and the people there were trying something called polyphasic sleep. So they were trying to sleep in naps, basically. There are a lot of different versions you can do it. There's like a website if you look up polyphasic sleep, there's a discord for it. And the model that I tried and have actually stuck with pretty closely for for the past decade, off and on a bit, you know, sometimes I go to conferences and need to stay up all day, for example, is taking a three hour core sleep at night. So last night I slept from 11 p.m. to 2 2 a.m. And then I'm up from 2 a.m. to uh, approximately, it depends a bit, but right now 5.40. And then I wake up at 6. That's also when my partner wakes up. And like during that time, I get a lot of deep work done. And then I'll take a nap around noon. So I took a nap right before we got on this call. Um, And then I take a nap right around dinner. Yeah. And then I sleep again at 11. And one of the theories of this is like... um, we spend a lot of time in light sleep. So all, most people know that there are like sort of two waves of sleep yeah, at night. Yeah. You go into the deepest of sleep and then you get out and go back in. Um, we spend a lot of time kind of preparing to get that that stage three and stage four and like REM sleep. And then we spend a lot of time kind of waiting for the next go around. And if you sleep in naps, potentially like in that three hour sleep, I just get one of those core cycles. And then my sleeping is, has very much changed since I started doing this. So when I take a 20 minute nap, I go straight into dreaming, for example. Wow. Like I go straight into that deep sleep. And I spend very little time in light sleep. I don't know Bam, how good this yeah. is for my health, but um, yeah, I'm not like recommending everyone do it, but it's fun and I enjoy it a lot. Okay, well, okay, I guess first question, do, do you use an alarm for these or do you just wake up naturally from it? I use an alarm. Um, I usually oh, use a, a vibrating alarm. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, I, I guess just for, well, for ethics sake, uh, I surely someone's brought this up to you, but... I've heard there's studies that suggest like this sort of cutting your sleep shorter consistently can lead to like a lower lifespan. Uh, Do you have any considerations on that or? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's risky. Um, I, there are a lot of people who have like lower sleep needs, and I think there's some positive evidence for it. Um, I think there's a probably a big difference between general sleep deprivation and cutting down that deep sleep and REM sleep and the light sleep. I still think light sleep is useful for some things. So, for example, like um, when I'm like building muscle uh, versus like cutting or, or maintaining, uh, sometimes I'll sleep more because I do think like sleep you you do important like muscle repair during that that you just don't get as much of when you're awake. Um, so it's like my eyes can get tired if like it's it's bright all around and like I, I need to at least like lie down in a dark room more and stuff like that. Um, sometimes I'll take I'll take an extra nap or two during the day. Um, I do wake up from my naps pretty naturally because that's so consistent that 20 minutes. Um, I also usually like listen to a bit of like uh, music like a uh, binaural stuff to to like put me to sleep really quickly. It's an interesting exercise. I mean, if, if you have the feeling in the morning of like being completely fresh to a project and starting your work day, I have that, you know, at least three times a day. Well, it's impressive. I, I don't know if I'll follow in those footsteps. Very different, but I've actually adapted something similar with eating where I try to only eat now within a certain time window, usually like four to eight hours. And I thought it would be misery, but or I thought I would just be too weak. But apparently, it gave you. It, I, I was I was shocked how easily I adapted to it after a couple of days. So I've mostly yeah. been doing that. Yeah, because you I know mean, if I, you're if you're used to three meals a day and you cut a meal like it is miserable. <laughs> but but if you time it just like if I go to bed where I'm just a little bit hungry and then I wake up I'm not hungry until like you know three nice. or four hours later or something like that. So. Yeah, I yeah, have the I time trying, right, but it, yeah, but yeah, no sleep. I uh, I've taken the opposite approach where I I figure I, sh- I should do whatever my body says I should do with sleep. Yeah. But, do you uh, ever nap? Do you ever do like a siesta in the middle of the day? Uh, not usually. I, mean, I, I don't know. It's like I like to go to sleep hard. I, I mean, if I'm if my sleep's kind of cut, I might do that. Okay, uh, but. Yeah, I know Edgar Allan Poe hated sleep. <laughs> he, yeah. He's, he's, I think he had a quote about seeing the slices of death. But uh, in, yeah. in terms of health, my understanding is it's kind of you're regenerating in sleep. Though 
I can also believe there's room for efficiency there, though. Man, four hours sounds like you're you're right in the margin there. Yeah, yeah. If yeah I, I, was, I do wish we know more. What there aren't there aren't great studies like there aren't good experimental studies in part because you do have to adapt to it. Um, so yeah. If I was, I mean, feel free to disregard this. If I was you, I would try to see what I could get away with without an alarm. You know, just mm -hmm. through mental conditioning, because then. If your body really needs to sleep, you'll probably still get it, you know. But if it's if it's just conditioning and you can get away with more, I would, I would feel like that would be a better way to kind of gauge it. Yeah. I often wake up the way, you know, most people do. So I'll, like, maybe wake up a few minutes before my alarm sometimes. I think I actually did that this morning. Um, it's like a nice vibrating alarm so it doesn't wake my partner up and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I've tried different things. Actually, in, in uh, college once, I tried alternating on and off of it and uh, doing like some sort of intelligence testing. Um, it ended up not working very well. I, I use like luminosity, one of these like brain training things, which just like you, you show uh, progress because it wants to keep you motivated and involved anyway. So it's pretty hard to tell what was working and what wasn't. Um, but one day I'd like to do something like that again and go on and off of it and see what the effects are short term. Yeah, yeah, I guess it won't tell you long term. Have you done, have you tried like monitoring like your, Whatever, whatever brain waves you go through while you're sleeping and kind of compare that to what's considered optimal or I've never done that. Um, I use like Fitbits and I've had different ones over the years to, that are have accelerometers and, and do heart rate and that sort of stuff. Um, and they like supposedly tell you what stage of sleep you're in. Um, I've wanted, they used to have a few years ago, uh, like Amazon or whatever had like a pretty good, um, EEG. Uh, my understanding is that there isn't currently a great consumer one available. Um, but if, if, if there's another one that becomes available, that's like highly recommended, I'll, I'll buy it and use it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if that's another thing I would do it, if I was use, see if you could find a sleep lab or something to try to get, get, yeah, get yeah. some hard data on this to figure out where you're at. It's like, no, you should be getting maybe 35 more minutes or, or something. Yeah. You could benchmark yeah. it. Y yeah. You could benchmark your brain. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Well, I guess all I have to say about that is, uh, paraphrasing, but I remember a quote in the movie Men in Black where they're talking about this odd sleep pattern and saying, well, you'll you'll either get used to it or suffer a mental breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of how I, that's what I would. Okay. Uh, again, if you need to go at any point, you can. Like we got all the, that's fine. the biggest questions. I guess I would, maybe one or two more was, uh, yeah, since from one of your other videos, it sounded like you were steeped in lots of philosophy philosophical concepts. I was wondering, I've generally thought of myself as kind of a utilitarian, but what I looked at it the other day and they had these tests that they all came up with like the most extreme scenarios for, for testing this that I was thinking, well, no, this sounds amoral. Like there's no good decision. It's just that some of them you can look at a little worse or better, but that doesn't seem like a good basis of <laughs> determining that. Like my general attitude is I feel like well, I mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of needs is I think we should have the greatest number of people getting their needs met in a long-term sustainable way that doesn't involve like something really torturous, you know, that's kind of fuzzy, but does that sound like utilitarianism to you or does it sound like something else or? I, I think it has, yeah, elements of it. I'm also, um, I, I turned on your chat now, so I'm. Uh, sure. If people have questions, uh, I can I can respond to them. Um, sure. So, I people handle this in different ways in philosophy because, like, we have these core. We try to come up with a philosophy that's well defined and then apply it to everything. And like, obviously, the real world's complicated. And then how to handle that is a, is a big open question. Uh, R.M. Hare, uh, one of the most famous philosophers of the 20th century, um, had two level utilitarianism. So the idea here is that there's two levels of utilitarianism that people talk about. One is act utilitarianism. This is what's what's talked about the most. It's every time you need to make a moral decision, you do your moral calculus and decide what's going to do the greatest good. The other one is rule utilitarianism, and you do that calculus to decide rules to live by. So to decide, okay, I'm going to not lie to anyone because I've decided that overall, you know, over the course of my life, implementing that rule is going to do the greatest good if I just never lie at all. Um, there are different decisions in life where sometimes we have the time and energy and ability to think through them critically. Like if you're just deciding whether to take a new job. 
you don't have to rely on heuristics. You can even like make a spreadsheet and all sorts of things. So two level utilitarianism is saying you switch between those according to, you know, whether you need to make quick decisions. It's kind of like system one and system two or, or fast and slow thinking. If people know this from like Daniel Kahneman's work and, and others, um, but you're applying that to morality and sometimes resorting to, I need to figure out what's going to do the greatest good, but sometimes not. And especially in cases where like uh, it's easy to steer yourself wrong. So I think like lying is a good example of this. In a lot of scenarios, if you analyze the short term, like what's going to happen to you today or how your friend or loved one is going to react to what you say, lying can seem appealing. It can be like, oh, well, they're going to be spared the suffering of whatever bad news I'm going to give to them. Um, but that's because like we have a lot of biases, cognitive biases where, for example, we we don't think enough about the long term. We don't realize yeah. that you're going to have to keep up that lie. You're going to end up messing it up. All those et other unforeseen variables, you know. Yeah, so the implementing the general rule in those cases is better, even if you had time to sit around and think about it, because it's just it's hard to reason about, and you can't really trust yourself to to know exactly when yeah. you can get away with not, with lying. Yeah. Okay. That being said, like if if there's a terrorist on an airplane, you know you might have like because those things sort of don't apply. Like you're not building a relationship with that terrorist. Oh, well, the, the ones I saw, okay well, I think like the trolley problem is like the classic one where oh, do you pull the where people are tied to a track and if you let it go, it'll kill five people. But if you switch tracks, they'll kill it's, uh, somebody that's amoral at that point. I mean, yeah, you could try to figure out, okay, whose life is worth more. But I find that going down that road of thinking probably doesn't take you to great places. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To, let's just save maximum number period. <laughs> Like, oh, or, or better yet, always... let's like try to prevent this situation from happening in the first place. You know, like hey, yeah. there's this like you call the cops, say hey, there's some psycho tie people to the tracks. You know, Ra radio ahead to the trolley guys. So, so I kind of see those situations as things have already broken down, and then it's more just spur of moment kind of thing. To... Well, yeah. it, it sounds like there's... I'm definitely that. It sounds like I'm a lazy version of the first one you mentioned about how they're kind of weighing situ like most of the time I'm just kind of on autopilot with morality. But then if there's such, like you said, a, a job, like I might have to think hard about, well, what I want to take that. Then I kind of make it more case by case then. So. Yeah. There, there are other ways to handle. So the two levels, one I like um, Tyler Cohen, who's another economist, um, he likes two thirds utilitarianism. So some people think of themselves as having like a moral parliament or, you know, a collection of, of moralities in their head and they like sort of each get a vote. Uh, so you might say, I'm utilitarian in most cases, I wanna do the greatest good, but like I'm not gonna go crazy with it. You know, one argument of utilitarianism is like, I wanna carpet the universe in hedonium. So so uh, software that is, and hardware that is optimized for producing the greatest happiness. I like to imagine Well, that's why I said sustainably, virtual... sustainably, you know? Yeah, yeah. You, you want the greatest happiness, heroin will probably get you there pretty fast, but not going to yeah, last <laughs> and then do well. Yeah, and that yeah. might be something we're not good at reasoning about. So yeah, two-thirds utilitarianism yeah. or something. But I have to, the other thing I was just going to say briefly is people constantly straw man utilitarianism. So the trolley problem uh, is one example. Yeah. The clear one is um, people say utilitarians are committed to the view that if they are a doctor and a patient comes in and they could kill the patient and use their organs to save five other people, they should. Like if we live in a society where doctors are doing that, people are not going to go to the doctors. That's yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, you're missing some variables on that one. Like, exactly. Okay, what what yeah. sort of societal standard does this set for people's well-being? Well, first off, you're killing the guy. You you are actually actively killing the one person. So you're you're not the good guy at that point. You're you're in a very dark gray area, even if you mean well. And second, there's probably a lot more good coming from having real disincentives towards killing people regardless of the reason than there are from like weighing it. So yeah, that, that one, that one's missing some variables, I think, you know? Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> so. right. Agreed. No, 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 look, a little, little too tunnel vision on that one. Yeah. But yeah, philosophically, I'm a utilitarian. Um, the other philosophical topic I care the most about. Well, okay, I think of often your philosophy in life needs to have three components. Um, what's what's good? What's your morality? What, what do you try to do in the world? Um, second, what do you know? And what's what's truth? 
Um, so there are different views on this, but mine's called positivism. So the idea that truth is uh, logically or empirically verifiable, this is kind of undergirds a lot of science, but you know, there's a lot of people who in philosophy, like um, want to focus more on concepts and things that aren't necessarily provable and things that we'll like never have access to. I do think all truth, you know, can be cashed out in some empirical prediction about the world. And then third is like some personal philosophy and like how do you live and what do you embody as a person? Um, and for me, that's stoicism. I, I like yeah. a lot of the, the mindfulness aspects and things like that. I'll be doing a, a 10 day silent meditation retreat next month. Um, I, there are elements of Buddhism that I've really liked. Buddhism, you know, even though there are versions of it that are very secular, it's still tied up a lot in religious and the supernatural and things like that. So that's one of the reasons I like stoicism. Well, well but, some things are kind of superhuman, yeah. maybe not supernatural, like the you know, I was thinking earlier, if it, if it had come up, I was actually thinking about bringing this up with talking about, like, defying our programming. They, some Buddhist monks can have verifiably done superhuman feats where they'll be underwater like a ridiculous amount of time releasing a bubble of air and then they don't have brain damage at the end of it or they can stay on, like, a, like you know, a really cold environment but can, like, increase their metabolism to give them off more heat or... Like it's yeah. just through just essentially hacking their brains, essentially through deep meditation. So. Yeah, it's so interesting what that, that raises a lot of questions for even what I was saying about, you know, we can't access what's going on in our brain. We don't know what's happening uh, for like what's conscious and what's not. So one of the things uh, in addition to like people who can control their autonomic nervous system, like their heart rate is um, your vestibular sense. So your senses that are like where your, your limbs are or your sense of balance, like are these conscious or not conscious? It's like not clear. You can kind of be aware of them at times and not at other times. These are interesting. I also see a question mark in chat. Oh, sure. Um, so so I'm just going to respond to this. Somebody asked about determinism versus free will, which we talked about earlier. Um, so I'll, I'll just briefly say that on free will, um, I think there are a lot of different ways to conceptualize it. Uh, most of them involve something like supernatural or dualist, in my opinion. Um, like I do think we're made of atoms or, you know, quantum mechanics. I am a believer in like the universal wave function is, is the physical reality. And that explains everything. So if your conception of free will doesn't, uh, fit with that, then I don't think it exists. But there are other people. So like, there's a philosopher, Christian List, who likes to view free will as like a level of understanding. So I like to talk about sociology as like, uh, yeah, in some sense, it's unnecessary if we just had psychology and, and biology and like the lower level things. Like we can explain everything with physics, but sociology is still really useful as a discipline because it's useful to to black box, you know, human individuals and sometimes even whole groups of individuals and analyze at that level, free will might be similar. And it's like good to, to think of humans as having choices and having free will, as long as some, you don't go too far with it. So some people think of like retributive justice and things like punishing people because they're, they're an inherently bad person. Um, and I have some kind of less free will views on those things, but it can be a useful as abstraction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going, it, it sure seems real to me. So I, I tend not to overthink it most yeah. of the time. Yeah. I think I'm. I think that's it for all the questions I have. We, uh, I guess, if the chat has any burning questions for JC, you can go ahead. Uh, this has been a great conversation. This, this is exactly the sort of thing I was hoping for. So uh, cool. I think this turned out great. Yeah. Um, what I most appreciate is that. Um, even when we didn't come to agreement, um, I think we got a better sense of like the contours and the dimensions and like this free will and how we both view it and and the agency aspect and the sentience and and like what things turn on and like um, I think I think actually the so a lot of people we call some people accelerationist. Uh, this has been used in in different social domains, but in AI, it's people who like just want AI progress as quickly as possible. Um, I think if you have the pessimism about where we're currently headed, that you just want to shake things up, you, that makes sense. And that yeah, you, so, yeah. So you understand where I'm coming from on this. Like it's not that yeah. oh yeah, we don't have to worry about any of these risks. It's like I'm weighing risk in my mind yeah. as I perceive it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, like I think a lot of our disagreements are just. How what makes sense to our own brains and personalities for us based off the data we have? Yeah. Uh, cool. Let's see, I'm trying to. Oh, whoops. Uh, I, I I have to be careful with the windows so I don't block. <laughs> uh, we we got lucky. I was able to solve that. The hey, I, the, the the chat formatting at the beginning because we we almost had you as a silent speaker, which was. No, not an uh, invisible speaker. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm glad we got that um, sorted out. 
just one thing somebody's asking about yours and my uh, heroes and inspiration. Um, I'll just briefly say on here, um, the, my book, I, I dedicated it to two people. So one thing we didn't get a chance to touch on as much, we could at another time, is a lot of people think about like human extinction versus non-extinction. I think this is like a really important question, obviously, like whether we continue to exist as a species or not. But relative to a lot of my peers, I'm pretty focused on like, if we continue to survive and expand to the stars, what kind of future will we build? Because I can very easily imagine a lot of dystopias and a lot of utopias. I think it's really important we steer that for the better. So people have talked about, you mentioned close calls with nuclear weapons and like Stanislav Petrov is sometimes thought of as like having the biggest impact on humanity because he refused to, to launch the nuclear weapons. Yeah. Uh, I think um, morally there are people who like very early on spread concern for animals. So it, I, I we shouldn't take it for granted that like some religions like um, Buddhism and Hinduism to an extent, have like a respect for animals enshrined in them. Um, other religions have this too, but it's like most explicit, I think, in those two. Um, so Ashoka was like an Indian emperor who uh, did a bunch of things, like passed a lot of very early kind of animal rights legislation. And I think really like steered world history in a big way that just had so many ripple effects down the road. Um, and then I also point to Pythagoras who did a similar thing in Greece, not from a political leadership position, but those are two people who like from this uh, quantitative perspective, effective altruism, thinking about your impact, I think had a really big positive influence. I don't have any heroes lined up that I can think of. So I'd have to think about it. I don't want to extend this. I'm going to have video chats after this anyway. So figure yeah, yeah. your, 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 Answers of the priority. Uh, cool. The, I had another thought, but it wasn't that important. So. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've noticed that that I, I can lose thoughts a lot, but I, I tend to remember emotionally the context of how important they were or how I felt about it. Or it's, it's, <laughs> like I, I tend to remember that aspect much better than the. Some for some people, this is the most exciting thing about AI is the ability to, by building a mind, better understand our own. Yeah. And hey, you know, for many purposes, I can see it being sentient enough as far as practical purposes for people, mm. you know, like mm. what? Well, yeah, we mentioned I mentioned some professions that it could maybe fill in the gap for people on. Yeah, so it's all. And, and this is just with language. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. And I, 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 even on my chart, I didn't rule out the possibility of. Uh, what, what I was calling godlike powers, basically the, the idea that we discover something, ab AI discovers something in science that redefines how we understand physics, you, you know, that unlocks abilities we never conceived before. That It's not yeah. impossible, it's just I wouldn't bet the farm on it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Well, well, yeah, r r real, r real lightweight question here. What are your thoughts about the fundamental distinction uh, between humans and AIs, the and the soul? <laughs> so, yeah. So we, we you, you could you could tackle it if you want. <laughs> no, it's an interesting question, and I think it has a lot of answer. Uh, it requires a lot of answers that we don't yet have, of like what fundamentally makes up these things, like consciousness and and free will, and how should we operationalize them, and what does it take to make them? Um, what is like fueling? What it means to be me? Is it quantum? Is it physical? Etc. But fundamentally, I do think whatever we are you can produce it artificially. You can create an artificial intelligence that has the same thing. Maybe it's really technically difficult and involves quantum computing, I don't know. Um, I think potentially we have futures of AI where we grow uh, AIs. Like we've talked about growing them kind of, you know, machine learning, but literally grow and, you know, uh, create a biological system that has all the complexity of neurons, but artificial and we can tune it and change it and make it super intelligent and so on and so forth. And I don't think there's any fundamental divide. And I think that we will at some point become digital minds and that'll be the future because there are just so many advantages to it. You know, if, if we can become uh, immune to biological disease, if we can copy and paste ourselves as easily as a computer program, I think there are a lot of reasons why, at least in the distant future, you know, tens of thousands or millions of years from now, um, um, digital minds will, you know, be the ones who populate the universe. Somebody's asking, do you think AI should be allowed to show or say they have any emotions? Yeah, I think that if we could uh, somehow like 
use AI as a tool and, and not create uh, persons or sentient beings as long as we um, don't understand that and aren't able to do so responsibly, I'd be in favor of, you know, not embarking down that part of the technology tree. Um, I think that's unlikely to happen. But yeah, if I had a magic wand and could do it, I think we should focus on like the safer versions of AI. Let's see, this is, a, this is another tricky question. Why do you think AI is being made to make more artistic efforts than manual and menial labor and other jobs? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier Polanyi's paradox, which is the idea that there's a lot in simple human action that we don't understand. Like there's just huge complexity in, in vision, in uh, picking up objects and carrying them, in walking. You know, as we've seen, you know, robotics have had so much money poured into them compared to other areas of AI, and we still, you know, struggle to get robots that can walk in natural environments. Um, there's another paradox called Moravec's paradox, which is very closely related, which is the idea that we've been very surprised by how much AI has automated more creative, artistic, seemingly intellectual jobs compared to the physical ones. I think it has a lot to do with that. I think the other big element is that when you think of what constitutes like a, a fascinating digital image or a creative story or text, um, it's incredibly complex such that um, we have kind of one channel of conscious thought as humans. We tackle things step by step. Um, we've got to like reason through things explicitly. We can draw on our intuition. Um, whereas these models are so large and have such distribution of their intelligence that they can form you know, pattern matching systems for tons and tons of elements of their environment. So think of an image and just like every curve, every color, every nuance of what insects tend to look like or cityscapes tend to look like it can load all those in and like synthesize them and manage them in a way that we can't as well so for yeah. example actually like the first turing test to be uh passed essentially which uh, means that an ai was indistinguishable from a human was for poetry and there's oh. a great paper that's showing with gpt2 with like a little human selection of the poetry you can trick people and they can't tell the difference between maya angelo and other poets and gpt2 poetry but poetry can get pretty free for it too, though. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Uh, in and fact, when, when I put this on YouTube, I'll, I'll put in my favorite poem. <laughs> like, oh, great. It's written by Daniel Pinkwater. <laughs> okay. He's a humor awesome. writer. Uh, well, there's a couple more questions, but I feel like these are getting – getting. well, one of them's relating to Asimov. I think I can answer this one for you saying it's not that simple. <laughs> like – for Asimov's yeah. three laws of robotics, uh, it's a good it's a good example of why AI safety is hard. Um, yeah. In particular, just if you think of like the logical consequences of following those rules. I mean, first of all, the the do not harm a human, just like implement like that. That is that, that's a million variables. To yeah, involved. Yeah, because there's always some small risk of some sort of harm. Yeah, it, it's, so it's it's a good starting point. Like it was really impressive for the 1940s to come up with that and run away, and I, that's when Asimov first uh, discussed it. Well, I think I'm, let's see. Yeah, I think we're seeing some repeats of stuff we saw earlier. I think sure. I'm going to close it out, though. You make me realize I have one more question for you. Yeah. Since you're such a fantasy buff, what are some of your favorite fantasy stories? Favorite fantasy stories? Um, modern stuff, I love Brandon Sanderson. I know this is cliche and lots of people do. Um, but Stormlight Archive, uh, the ongoing series he's writing is fantastic. Okay. Mistborn. Um, which I think is in discussion for a movie now. Um, most, I think it's over 50% of his writing is set in the same universe. Actually, the only other major uh, science fiction or fantasy author to do this was Asimov, and it was it was um, uh, retconned. So um, Foundation, his series, is actually in the same universe as Robots, um, but I think he only decided that sort of after the fact, you know, after they had started it. But Brandon Sanderson has, like, started his career knowing he wants to put everything in the same universe. It's, it, it, I, won't, I won't spoil anything about it, um, but, like, drawing threads and connections that you can see if you've read multiple of the books. Like and I think it's just, like, a unique... Yeah, it's a unique opportunity. Yeah, it's a web. It feels a lot like... Um, I know I liked Game of Thrones, um, the TV show and the books, because it was such a web. It was so intricate and you could tell how something in the north was affecting something in the south and so on. So those are kind of cliche answers, but those are big ones. I, I, I saw the first season of Game of Thrones. It, I thought it was really well done, but it, it was too nihilistic for me <laughs> Like at, at the end because I was like, 
Yeah, okay, spoiler for end of season one if you don't want to hear it. Like, once they killed Sean Bean, I was like, well, what's the point? <laughs> like, right, this right. is, uh, he was the closest thing we had to, to a protagonist in my eyes. So. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, um, pulled up pulled up a list, so I'll rattle off a few. Um, this is actually mostly science fiction, but sure. Ian Banks, um, Ian M. Banks, um, the Culture series is fantastic. That's actually really good for talking about digital minds and what a future of them could look like. Um, I like the book Cloud Atlas and the movie. Um, that's kind of fantasy elements mixed with science fiction. Um, and maybe the last one I'll mention is um, Ted Chang's short stories. Really great stories of your I life and I others. Do you, do you know the movie Arrival? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, read, the, I, I read that one. Oh, great. I, I might that's be mixing some up, though. Yeah, yeah I, I've, I've, I've seen Arrival and I read the short stories. My... Yeah, he was actually the keynote speaker at a conference we hosted here at the university in October. Um, because uh, he's like done such creative work, and that's sort of what we need in AI is people with blue sky thinking. Well, I think, yeah, we went on longer than I expected, but it was a pretty good talk. Uh, I think Great. I'll go ahead and close it out. Uh, thanks for showing up. This is, of course. again, exactly the sort of thing I was hoping for. I think we, I, I feel like I better understand the perspective now, and it feels more like. Uh, I'm going, now that I'm seeing the situation, it's more like I'm, uh, as far as reaching sentience, I'm more glass half empty, you're more glass half full on it, is might be one mm. way to kind of interpret it. Because there is a lot of unknown, so I'm kind of going by what I see, and you're kind of going by, well, this sure What's seems possible? like we could mm -hmm. here go this way, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Um, I'm excited for you to like keep exploring this and other topics. Um, I didn't, I didn't know your work as well, but you know, I started. I watching just started your... doing these. Most of my vast majority of my videos are just kind of goofy comedy stuff. I could send you a link to one or two no, afterwards if you want. It's good to it's good to mix it up and draw those parallels. Yeah, but I, I'm I've been doing chats with my uh, viewer base for a while now, just as kind of a proof of life thing. I, I, nice. I thought it'd be interesting to have other people on and it just Yudkowski contacted me kind of sort of kicked that off and I decided well yeah I want to do more of this and then you already emailed me before I decided so perfect so cool I'll, I'll, yeah I have a few more people on the next one will not be about AI mostly I, I, personally I've lined up it's going to be more about art so in case, nice. in case people are getting sick of AI we're, we're, I feel like I got the answers I was looking for from this one so Great. between, okay, between well, yeah. both I feel like Yudkowski helped really refine my thinking. That's why I made yeah. that chart afterwards because I, I felt like we kind of met, we were kind of like missing where we were aiming several times, but you, you yeah. were much more on target for me, so. Awesome. We'll keep in touch. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll email you after this. All right, well, whoops, <laughs> blocked your view for a second. I guess that's it. So I'm gonna head stop the recording.